The podcast on Haunted Hill will contain spoilers and swearing. I am the devil, and I am here to do the devil's work. Okay, so it is my call. Be one of us. I didn't tell you my name. Hang up. I didn't tell them my name. Hello and welcome to the podcast on Haunted Hill episode, a nice evened out number, 125125, I'm Gav. And I'm Dan, Uh, welcome. Welcome, if you've never heard this show before, we uh, talk about horror films, we we do jokes at each other, we do laughs, don't we? we? We do questionable impressions and impersonations, and generally we're we're very well known for our incredible ability to go off on the weirdest tangent ever. And I've heard like you've got many pubs in like the uh, darkest bits of Cornwall and like some little pub. They talk about us and stuff. Have you heard they do, the pubs? bastards. We're we're well known. And famously, about. you almost died laughing uh, about three or four episodes ago because yeah. of a donkey with some custard. It's heading. <laughs> it don't start, it don't start. In the window. This is uh, episode 125, and this is a new thing we're doing. We've only done one of them, but this is our second... Yeah, the second one. ...patron's pick. Yeah, thank you very much um, to our lovely patrons, and if you want to become a patron and be able to do this thing yourself and join in with us in our menage a trois of audio pleasure. Um, uh, our silent partner in this is RJ. Yeah, RJ McCready is the patron in question uh, for for this episode. And what does that mean? So what that means is uh, we're every three episodes, we and this is the second time we've done this now, one of our patrons gets to pick two films that are special to them or, or mean something to them. And as long as they're in the vein of horror, fantasy, sci-fi, we will watch those. We will talk about them. We will give our opinions and go off on our famous tangents talking about them um and also what's brilliant is so far matthew and now rj have both sent a lovely email with a little bit of information about why they picked these films what you know what they mean to their memories of first watching them so we get to do that and it it means that instead of gav and i just talking about you know the next film in a franchise or the usual horror stuff sometimes we get to go off in a little fancy direction so with matthew we got to talk about Hansel and Gretel, but we also got to talk about the incredible Bram Stoker's Dracula, uh, which, which we had a lot of fun. We, yeah, had discussed before, really. I don't know why. It's, uh, yeah, I don't know why. So it's a very good one in the old Dracula library. Yeah, and um, well, I may as well say what RJ's picked. Uh, he has sent an email, which I'll read out later in the episode. But he has picked two films from the 70s, uh, and these both star the infamous Doug Doug McClure. Doug McClure. You may remember me from such films. Have you have you seen The Simpsons? I do know the character. Yeah, I do. And he's based on Doug McClure and some Troy someone. I don't know who. Um and weirdly as well it's the same director, a director called Kevin Connor as well. Um Doug McClure. I was earlier watching one of the films and I was like, yeah, whose voice does that remind me of? And I was like, he is kind of like this. It's kind of the same sort of being movie actor. Bruce Campbell, he sounds exactly like Bruce Campbell. Not exactly. Yeah, he sounds very I know what you similar mean. to Bruce Campbell in the way he says it. And it's just like, whoa. Uh, and that came out a couple of times. I was like, who's that line of it? Like, tweaked my... Tweaked me out You're right. Front. It's the way he delivers lines like, hey, come on, come on now, guys. Let's yeah. all... Yeah, and yeah, he's so also much. got a very strong chin as well, yeah. much like Bruce. So, and the kind of sort of action horror movie. So he's kind of like yeah, Bruce Campbell from uh, seventies. Yeah, indeed. Well, the two movies starring double Doug McClure. Never knew we'd be doing a Doug McClure double bill. And that's why I love these patron picks. So thank you, RJ. We are looking at 1974's The Land That Time Forgot, and also uh, 1978's 
Warlords of Atlantis, also known as Warlords of the Deep, which Gab pointed out to me sounds like it could be a porno. Warlords of the Deep. Um, but yeah, so that's the two movies we'll be looking at. We'll get into the why RJ's picked those at some point. Um, RJ McCready, obviously not his real name, but that's his name he goes by online. He's done uh, his own show uh, for a while. He did um, Bite Size Horror, um, Bite Size Horror, Bite Size Cinema Podcast. Uh, he also now does a podcast with me called Blame It on the Aliens after a small retirement from podcasting. And we first met RJ um, in a queue to go and see the incredible John Carpenter I, live in I, London. I was pimping this podcast. You were. You had your... Um, well, I had the T-shirt on for the podcast in Wanted Hill. You had... I don't remember what... I think you had Halloween, Halloween or something. Yeah. yeah. And I had my purple leather jacket, which, which RJ said... He thought I thought I was trying to be Star Lord from uh, Gal- Guardians of the Galaxy, <laughs> and we met this guy. He's quite a tall, handsome fellow, RJ. And uh, we turned around, and there he was, and he sort of started chatting to us. And we pointed out this, um, you know, we we do a podcast. Yay! I always, I always do like pimping. I did loads of fright first actually. But um, yeah, we went and watched John Carpenter live, um, and then we actually bumped into him two or three times during the course of the evening. You know, at the, either at the bar or at the merch stand or something. And we ended up sort of adding each other on Facebook, becoming friends. He became a listener of our show and, and also a friend. You know, and he came to your birthday party. And he's come to yeah, Bristol to visit a, me a few times. Yeah, 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 and cool. yeah. we've actually be, just become great friends with him. Um, I don't remember know, me, any of that party. I think he and I message each other every couple of days with something ridiculous about a memory from the 80s or something. And yeah, so it's really, really fun. This will be a fun one, um, a fun one for him to do, uh, for him to pick. So yeah. excited for that. Yeah, thank you very that's much, what we're doing. Mm. Yeah, thank you. So that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. But let's get into, uh, uh, this is our intro. So we always discuss what we've been watching, each of us, where we've been, what's been going on, things that are happening and coming up. So first of all, we're a bit delayed because Gav has been a little bit under the weather, haven't you, Gav? What have you had? Uh, I had COVID, but I hey. thought I thought it was a cold. Um, to the point, though, where Sarah came to visit me last weekend um, because we were supposed to be going to London to do like this gangster tour thing, and um, I had tickets booked and everything. And she came down, and I was just like, "Look, I feel like uh, I just this cold's rubbish. I don't want to drive up to London and just all that hassle." So um, uh, then, then she left, and on Monday, <laughs> I tested positive. I was like, "I'm so sorry." Gave it to her. She gave it to her daughter. Who now oh, her no. son now has it. Uh, so I feel so guilty about this. But anyway, yeah. So um, I had, I've had COVID. Um, so I binge stuff. I did, I did watch the Obi One program because I was just literally like sitting on the fucking because I've got Disney now. Ah, I've, good. I've kept I've kept Disney after with Prey and stuff. I always thought, well, like, what the fuck do I want Disney for? Because uh, I, I don't really, I'm not going to watch the Marvel movie. I did watch a new Thor movie on the day it was released. I felt like a right superhero fan. Yeah, boy. Um, yeah, Disney Plus is good because, okay, yeah, it's got the Star Wars and it's got the Marvel, but there Star, is a bunch of other I stuff. stuff I watched, <laughs> yeah, Mark, it's all about I watched Star. Marks, uh, Marked for Death the other night. Is yes. that the one that you talked about? Yes. That was that was actually all right. What was it supposed to be? You said it was originally for someone else, or, or like a dive um, guard, or a lethal Ch- weapon, Ch- or something? Chuck Norris, or something like that. I can't remember who was it was. Was it supposed to be like something else, like a different movie? Like, uh, um, I, don't, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, I, I thought yeah, you said something. Um, it's all about it, stars. Stars has got like loads of horror films. All the alien movies are on there. It's got some really good stuff on there. It reminds me very much of like video shops used to be, because the selection isn't huge. It, it, do you know what I mean? There's probably yeah. only like 26 horror titles. So it's like, well, okay, it's cool. Rather than just fucking endless, endless content. So it kind of makes me feel like I'm in the video shop. So I like, watched. So the other night I was like, action movie. I was like, I watched a Steven Seagal movie and I quite, yeah. quite enjoyed it and I wouldn't have watched it unless it was like that and it was like being in the video shop going eh, I've watched this Steven Seagal movie and there's this one bit where he stands there and this dude goes by him and he does like a donkey kick behind him he just like puts, <laughs> his, he puts his kick up behind him it's not even very forceful the guy flies through into a wall and it's like oh my god it's just laughable his martial arts absolutely hilarious but yeah I enjoy I enjoyed Disney it's not too bad I, uh, I watched um, uh, 
on deadly ground the other night with Steven Seagal. I was thinking of watching Nico and and Nico's fantastic. Um, some of the other on ones. deadly ground, where where uh, the only film you see Steven Seagal and the baddie in it is Michael Caine. So if you want to see that how that pans out, <laughs> what? Yeah, Michael Caine is the baddie in it, and he's the, like a badass. Alan. Or... Alan. Yeah. But he's trying to put on an American accent. Steven. So, Steven. Like, Steven Seagal, fucking come over here. And Steven Seagal's like, listen, I will beat the shit out of you and all of your colleagues. It's so good. None of that martial arts bollocks with me, <laughs> Steven. <laughs> you're a big man. <laughs> but you're out of shape. He is a big man these days, isn't he, Stephen? Uh, yeah, and he's out of shape. Um, okay, well that's good. I'm glad, I'm glad that you. I'm <laughs> yeah. glad that COVID drove you to Stephen Seagal. <laughs> and I watched the Obi Wan pro- program. Uh, Tell I me what you thought of, of Obi Wan. Um, I felt at times a little bit forced. I don't know why. <laughs> that wasn't a really bad pun. Um, uh-huh. I, uh, I don't know why though. Um, but there were some things in it here and there which were a bit like, oh, what happened? What? Just little things which pulled me out of it. Only once in a while. Apart from that, I quite enjoyed it because I like Ewan McGregor as I'm Obi Wan, and it's nice me because too. I like I. I'm a fan of like the original movies, and as a kid, I watched the first Star Wars over and over. So it's nice to know that that's kind of that world and put my mind back there. It's quite cool. Yeah, it's not related to anything else in in some ways. I mean, obviously, yeah. it sets a few things up, but I yeah. really like I liked the Obi Obi Wan show, and again, it's it's all about Ewan McGregor. Really, I think yeah. he's fantastic as Obi Wan. He was brilliant in the pre. He's one of my favourite things in the prequels, really. So oh, I'm glad you enjoyed that. That's really good. Mm. So we've both been watching some Seagal, and we <laughs> you've been watching some Star Wars. Um, which is great. Um, I finally got around to watching a film which, when it came out, I didn't like. Uh, Midsummer. I watched it. Really didn't get it, get what all the hype was about. I watched it again the second time around. I liked it more, but I'm still not on the hype train for it. I think it will take another watch. A bit like Hereditary. I feel like it's a very... There was a lot of hype around that. I didn't like it the first time, but I get I get it with Midsummer. What I liked about it was the gore, like when the guys fell off the cliffs and stuff like that. Um, I just still not right quite there, but I'm going to give it another go. What well, you like? You like Midsummer, don't you? Well, firstly, I do admire your patience with films. What like, for giving them another chance? Just being able to do that. I am not like that. I'm I know, so but I've got so much to do. I don't have it's time. Be, but it's because I, I know that it's a good film. I just, just sometimes I know yeah. if I'm not in the right frame of mind or, you know, sometimes I need to have read a little bit about it or, or understood why it was made or, you know, something about behind the scenes. And then I might enjoy it more. I'm a weird fellow like that, Gav. Weird fellow. Uh, it's quite funny, actually, if if people, some people knew the backstories and like when the, how they were made and things of lots of films which you don't like, you'd probably go, actually, I totally appreciate and like appreciate this and like this. But obviously, every movie has to be valued on its the same merit, every on the same baseline. So. Yeah, and I think that's the difference between someone who just watches a film or someone who's a film fan like us and many people that we know. Uh, a film fan, I think. Appreciate yeah, nice the look film. Up the trivia when you watch yeah, the movie. Yeah, you appreciate a film not just for the film. Obviously, that's incredibly important. But things like Evil Dead or or, or Jaws, you know, these movies. So much went on behind the scenes that makes you love them even more and appreciate them even more. You know, Evil Dead is a very low budget film. Like, and if you showed it to somebody these days, if you showed it to a teenager now, they probably wouldn't think it was any good. But because we know the blood, sweat and tears and the three or four or five years that went into making it. It inspired me. Yeah, exactly. You know, so I, I think, I think you know, that's the difference between a film fan and just someone who just watches a film, you know? Yeah, totally. Mm. There we go. Bit of a tangent already. Speaking of Jaws. I was going to say, tell me more. I saw it in the cinema in 3D. Three dimensions. 3D? There's three, three dimensions of uh, Rob Schneider. Oh, wow. Rob Schneider, Adam Sandler, and um, Chris Rock. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was really cool to watch. Like You know, like the camera um, sort of bobs up and down in the water, so half of the the, uh, uh, the uh, screen downwards is the yeah. water, and the half would be like, and you see the boy bobbing up and down. Yeah. 
that was so like three D. So it's like the water is coming out. This like rectangle of water just out of the screen. It was like this is weird. <laughs> like, <laughs> like this is really strange. Um, but yeah, some really good bits. And I've never seen Jaws in a, a proper cinema. I, my own old school cinema. Like I had it at the house. I did, but um, I didn't actually see it like in a cinema with surround sound, proper surround sound. So it's really good to do that. But yes. I went with all the kids. Um, <clears throat> one thing, one before I got into it, um, really randomly, the, one of the funniest things that didn't involve the movie Jaws, but I, I got to the seats for the kids. So it's Elijah, who's like eight, the youngest, then going up to Jay's 15 and Daisy 12. I was like, right, you've got your 3D glasses, you've got your snacks, you've got your seats, I'm off to the loo, I'm gonna leave you here. It's like, Jay, keep an eye on them. <clears throat> so I go down, come back. And I go upstairs, and this is it's quite funny because I can see all the people when I'm coming up. There's loads of a lot of guys all were like their Quint T-shirts, Jaws T-shirts, just loads of Jaws fans, uh, all their 3D glasses on. And uh, I get up there, and um, Daisy just knows. So Elijah goes, "What's up?" It really threw me. Like what? And then Daisy goes, "What's up?" <laughs> and it was just quite <laughs> quite in the cinema. So all the people around kind of started chuckling a bit. It's like all of a sudden they're throwing me this nineties term. I was like, "What the fuck's going on?" I was like, <laughs> "So I was just like, what's up?" <laughs> and then just sat down and put on my three D glasses. It was really random. That like, is weird. Yeah, but that's very amusing. But yeah, three D three D Jaws is amazing. There's one, you know, the bit at the end where uh, he's he's on the old end of the boat and he's about to try and, and shoot says, the shark. Smile, um, you son of a bitch. Yeah. Before you get that, when he's trying to just perch himself on it, you get this like long shot where the end of the boat is, um, uh, you're looking, it's very close up to the, the lens on the left. So it goes off into the distance to the right. Yeah, if that makes sense. And mm -hmm. yeah. In 3D, I thought it was going to almost go poke me in the fucking face. Like, Jesus <laughs> Christ, it's like proper stuck it stick out. It's kind of like when they did like the Friday the 13th part of 3 in 3D, and then he puts the broom to the camera or whatever the fuck it yeah. was. It was like they're doing that. But this was like unintentional. They didn't make the movie think in 3D. So it's just like, wow. It's just like a nice, a nice, a nice angle. But stuff like that is really good. So um, this, this is what interests me because. Um, a lot of the time, if, when they go back and they make a film 3D, yeah. it's never done. It's never done very well, is it? And I don't mean done very well as in it's made by no. I mean it's no, not. Course, it, it, the it, process it, isn't very well done. But yeah, I don't even know how they do it. Uh, Spielberg uh, uh, has uh, signed it off and said, "Yeah, it's all good." It must um, have cost a bomb to go back and, and it, change every. It's really interesting. You're on the beach, looking at the beach, and the the people in the, in the background are really layered. So you've got layers of people, mm. and then you've got the. Uh, Right up here, and, it, and the, your sheriff right up in your face. Sort of How thing. did the uh, push pull shot? Did that look any different? Um, do you know what? I can't even remember. Can, oh, do you know? There's a second. I could have missed that for a second. Occasionally, I had to tell uh, Elijah to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like, shh, guys, shh, 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 is this But you Jaws? highly recommend it. Jaws uh, 3D. If you can watch it in 3D, and uh, you're a Jaws fan, you should definitely watch it. But there's like a kid next to me. Must have been about 15. It's really annoying. I think he's you know, sexually frustrated because his legs just shook the whole time. And it's just like, mm. oh my God, stop doing it. Anyway, he jumped at times. Like, and he was like, oh my God, like that. And like, so we, we were sister and that. And then the mum was laughing. So I guess the mum's like, come on, we can go watch Jaws. You know, and then my kids jumped a few times. And Jay got out and Jay said, that movie gets better and better every time. Because Jay's 15 now, so Jay is watching it and understanding more and more as you go. I'm even now still understanding stuff because I'm a dad and I'm watching it and I'm, there's, you know, that movie's such an incredible film. I was with Jay the first time that they watched that. I remember we watched that in your living room together. Okay. And they swore under their breath at the head bobbing along. Oh, uh, they went. They went, oh shit. And then they looked at me and I just went, it's all right, I'm not going to say anything, but I told you later on, but you thought it was funny because she kept it to herself, but it was, like, it was still like yeah. that, that head bobbing bit. So do you think we'll eventually get to Jules 3D in 3D or are they going to stop at this one? <laughs> Oh no no no! no. We gonna, don't need they're that. They're not going to spend the money on anything like that. No, it's just a, one of it's a really random thing to do. I don't know why or, or how this came about, but uh, I'm thankful it did. So yeah, I do brilliant. recommend. Nice one, man. Oh, I'm pleased. Really pleased. Um, well, 
Uh, I was going to ask you how porn would look in 3D, but I'm going to skip over that. I've thought but about what, that before, though. I'm sure most men have. <laughs> but what I will say is, talking of porn, I weirdly watched, not porn, but a two films by a director who definitely could be a porn star. Uh, and the director I'm talking about is a Dutch guy called <laughs> Dick Mass. <laughs> <laughs> Always makes us chuckle, this guy. He's such a uh, great name. Dick Mass, he did that Christmas movie. What if he's like, watched. oh, can I, can I be on your show? We have to interview him. So, hi, Dick. So, you know, so, so we now have Dick? Dick Mass on. Dick Mass. See if we can fit Dick Mass in. <laughs> it's just because Mass is, he, he could be <laughs> a, a, a length for size, you know, Dick size, Dick Mass. Um, but Dick Mass has directed a few strange and wonderful films um uh, that christmas horror movie that we we reviewed which is called um what was it called saint saint or, or Sint. Sint. yeah uh and also pray the movie about, pray. Yeah. when the horse the horse is going along the rooftops yeah i know it's fantastic and that the movie called pray p-r-e-y not the predator prequel pray no, no but this, that's a good one though this this one pray with the lion in the city and a, and yeah. a, and a hunter in a wheelchair well, I watched two of his movies. Um, one of them was actually recommended by R.J. McCready, funny enough. And it's got a fantastic title for a start. And he sent me a clip of it on WhatsApp and said, Dan, you've got to watch this film. And I said, oh, that's on my watch list on Prime. So I might bump that up. It's called Amsterdam. Uh, and it's basically like a giallo mm. 80s detective, but set in Amsterdam. That obviously. bit when the prostitute goes over the boat. Or the sex worker goes over the boat, like drapes over it. Yeah, she's hanging from the bridge and she scrapes across the boat with all the tourists on it. (laughs) And it's actually a really fun... It's 1988, but it feels older than that. It feels like a very early 80s, but it's a really fun... And I mean, the title alone, Amsterdam, is brilliant. And it's about a serial killer who swims around in the... uh, the canals of Amsterdam popping up and killing people and it's just great and you've got this fantastic detective who is like you know he's like Magnum PI or something he's just brilliant so I really enjoyed that one and then while I was you know I was in the mood for more Dick Mass Gav (laughs) (laughs) so uh, a couple of nights later it had been on my list to watch and I got around to watching uh, The Lift from 1983 I have seen it I don't remember I think I watched it on YouTube once yeah, it's on YouTube. That's how I saw it. Uh, yeah. This this is about a um, a lift that's got some AI in it. I don't know why you'd need to put such technology in a lift, uh, especially in 1983. But this lift, this AI has got some evil force within it, and the lift decides it's going to start killing and eating people. Um, and there's some really great deaths in it. People getting sliced in half or falling down. The, I think the blind man falls down the lift shaft is my favourite. Um, and that's that was great as well. So. Dick Mass, keep it coming. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, I don't know. The last movie was Prey. I don't think he's got anything else up because I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. I watched it. I did. Um, I uh, uh, thoroughly enjoyed watching Prey with Sarah. And just like, I'm really enjoying this because, in a, in a, you know, it's, it's not. It's not. The shining. It's like not the pain. shining, but yeah, no, it's fine. I knew I'd like it though because I love um, animal attack films. I I, I'm, I want to see that beast, that new one with uh, Idris. Oh, oh with Idris Elba with the lion. Yeah, that looks good that looks too. Right. Right. Yeah, I do like I do like my animal films. Yeah, me too. I watched Lake Placid the other day, and it's been it's all right. It's funny. It's fun. It, yeah, there's some bits that could be better. It's a shame, but it's it's all right. It's, it feels a little wasted actually. There's some good, good actors in there. So. We should probably put together an Animal Attacks uh, episode at some point, you know? Yeah, well, there's obviously, um, I know Bo, I think Bo's a, a fan of the old 70s animal attack films and stuff. And Gri- he's a big fan of Grizzly. Yeah, the bear uh, movies. Stuff. Which yeah, is brilliant, you good, know. And, some good, um, good films. Day of well, the Animals. Day of the Animals, that's what I was trying Leslie to think Nielsen, of. Leslie yeah. Nielsen, who's a bear, bear back, a bear wrestling. He's not a bear back. <laughs> I mean, he is, he is. Shirt- he's shirtless. shirtless and he fights a bear. Uh, which what? doesn't make any sense, but literally, the trailer for that movie could be like literally like ping, just a quick glimpse of Leslie Nielsen, ah, and a cut then, and back a few more times of just Leslie Nielsen and the bear, and you'd be like, dumb, Day of the Animals. You'd be like, I'm going to go watch that. Leslie that Nielsen's wrestling the bear. I'm going to go watch it. I don't yep. need anything else in the movie. Selling tickets. 
Easy peasy. I own that. Yeah. No, do I own that? No, I don't own that. I was about to say it's in my collection. It's not. I've got Grizzly. I also... We've talked about this kind of type of film before. I'm about to mention. You know when you watch a film and you think, oh, yeah, that's really good. I'm going to watch it again. And then you think, well, no, it's really shit. We talked about this on the last episode. I can't remember which film it was, but you said there's always a film that tricks you into thinking it's going to be better than it is, and then you've watched it about four times, and you think, oh, no. I do have, I do have movies coming. One one film for me like that is Chinatown. I've seen it three times now, and I just, each time I'm like, oh, I'm going to like that movie, and I get to end of it, I'm like, I don't, I don't really like this movie, and I don't know why. Um, yeah, there well, are films like that. Do you why do you have something like that? Yeah, I mean, I rewatched. I think it's the third or fourth time now. Oh, stage, I, stage four. I've fallen asleep through four times. The eighties slasher. This is a newer film. This is two thousand and sixteen, and it's probably about the third or fourth time I've watched it now. And I think it'll be the last time I've watched it now. <laughs> it's the same with the Babadook. I've watched that about three or four times, and actually, you know what? I think I don't like that. I think it's a shit film, and I'm not into it. Dedication, man. Roy Castle will be proud. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Beyond the Gates is what I'm talking about. Lucio? Uh, no, 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 Beyond the Gates, as in they find a VHS board oh, game. Oh, no, yeah, I, I was duped into this. I even pre-ordered a DVD when it was going to be released, because I was like, oh, that looks great. I it's love, got Barbara like, Crampton in it. Yeah, it's yeah. great. Watched it, and it's just like, I don't know like this film. Yeah, it keeps showing up on the Horror Channel, and... I've, like I said, it must be three or four times now, and I sat down and watched it again right the other night. As well, you know, it's a good concept, but it's, it's like Jumanji. But if Jumanji was one of those VHS horror board games you'd get back in the day, it just you know, doesn't roll the dice. It just doesn't deliver, though. No. So that's what I was going to mention. That that I'm done with that one. I wash my hands of it now. Done, dusted, and out. How many times did you watch it? To, to, I've watched it three or four times now over the to years. Decide for that. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, last thing I want to mention, and then we will talk about something that's coming to distribution, which is exciting. Um, I've talked on the last episode that I've finished season one of True Detective and thoroughly enjoyed it. I finally finished season two. Yeah, I've never gone there. Uh, what's it like? I enjoyed it. It's not quite, as a lot of people have said, it's not as good as season one. But it is Colin Farrell, Vince Vaughn, and some other great actors and actresses in it. Um Colin Farrell is just so intense and everything he's in he's brilliant it's very very gritty it's more it's more about sort of corrupt cops and stuff this time around and a lot of mental health and drinking as opposed to the first one which was just some weird ritualistic killer out in the backwoods um, this one is more about the corrupt cops in the inner cities and the crime you did, you did have a dynamic in, in the first season with their, their downfall like the uh... All right, all right, all right. All Ed right, all right. His, uh, his, performance, his, his character going downhill. He drinks a lot in that, doesn't he? He gets fucked, but he looks awful at the end of it from where he starts off. He does. I'm excited to watch season three, though, so I will get around to that at some point. Yeah, but, right, let but, me know what that's like, or let us... Let you and the listeners know. Lovely, so, gorgeous listeners. Very quick tangent here, then, guys, before I, Gav talks about the next thing. So, for anyone that doesn't know... We have Deadbolt Films, which is our production company. We've done a few shorts. Uh, we've done a couple of features. Um, we've got a comic, a couple of comics, a couple of podcasts, da 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 da, da. Deadboltfilms.com. We'll talk about more about that more at the end. Our very first thing, the reason Gav and I really got and became very good friends... Well, I started Deadbolt because I had to have a company. Well, uh, you had to have a name. There's a thing behind yeah. you. The first thing we did was uh, 2012... Um, 2011. 2011. Well, it started before then, but we finally sat down. In, well, we sat down. We ran around in the woods and created our first feature, which was The Shadow of Death, um, starring me and lots of our good buddies and friends that are actors and anyone that we could that would come and help out. Made for next to nothing, but we had a blast and it's got some great reviews. It's been on YouTube and got a ton of uh, views on there. Da, 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 da. The Shadow of Death. Anyway, Gav hits, hits me and a lot of the other people involved in the project, which, as we said, is a very long time ago. You hit us with some news the other day, Gav. On that, what was that news? On a group of WhatsApp, because I can say I've had the contracts so over. I'm silent, but it, it's, it's fine to say it before. I don't think that they could pull out for any reason. Um, uh, the Shadow of Death are going to be distributed, which is really randomly weird. Fantastic. After Out the 10 blue. years since I let it loose. Yeah. Crazy. Uh, so it's not on YouTube anymore. That's been pulled. 
Um, yeah, and, and it's interesting because it's the UK, old UK VHS label, Vipco. Do you know the label? Yep, I do. I've heard of it, yep. That, they have essentially picked it up, um, but they've been picked up by this other company in America, uh, Bay View Entertainment, uh, have picked up Vipco and they've merged together and they thought Shadow Death would be good on the uh, on their catalogue. So that's it's incredible. Cool. So it get like it's only a little thing. I, I don't think it, you know, it get like a, an American DVD release. Um, not in England, unfortunately, um, but it will be on Prime and all that jazz. So. Yeah, um, um, which is great because you, you do have a lot of content you're sitting on behind the scenes stuff. We also recorded a commentary track many years ago. Um, a few of us all got together with some beers at yours and recorded a commentary track. So, well, fingers crossed, we can get all this together and yeah, we'll, we'll keep you guys posted. But that's a very unexpected and very exciting piece of news. Yeah, it's uh, um, uh, it's cool. Um, so it's really random that that's been done. But uh, yeah, so it's it's good. Just got a new poster done for it, and it's a new color. When we went to lockdown, I actually color graded it again. Kind of, uh, I don't know, out of boredom. Um, so I color graded the film again, and um, yeah, it's it's just kind of a little bit different. So I'm just getting contracts signed at the moment and stuff. But yeah, so that's gonna be released. So when it is, I'll let everyone know, so you can just watch it. Like, and uh, I'm going through subtitles at the moment, which is quite amusing because I have to go through the whole script. It's brilliant because sometimes <laughs> it, 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 what the program you're using, you've sent me some screenshots where it thinks the person's saying one thing, but they're really not saying that thing. No, no, no. Uh, oh, I was only at once where I it said the wrong thing. That's just because I'm, I'm dictating it. I watch it. I add oh, the subtitle. Okay. I dictate it to my computer. So once it gets, occasionally you get something wrong. But no, most of the things are like, you're saying like shit and stuff like that, you know. Yeah, it's hilarious. And the screenshot of me is just me saying shit or prick. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there we go. So that's really exciting news. And um, the last piece of exciting news, and we've got a little special uh, bit coming up actually in a sec, um, is that Gav, as usual, this year, just back, hot off the press, Possibly where he got COVID. This is where I got COVID. <laughs> From uh, London's Fright Fest Festival yeah. 2022. Yes. Gav, <clears throat> tell us about your experience. Um, yep, yeah, me and Mark went along. Um, a couple other buddies we could come along and they had COVID and couldn't come along. So me and Mark went along and um, it was cool. Uh, bumped into Boz there. Um, he recorded a little thing with us talking, which we're going to play after this. Um, but it's cool to be at Fright Fest again and lots of people there. Um, bumped into a couple of people I knew, so had loads of some people. Chatted to some new people um, and watched a couple of movies. Watched Fall, the one with the two women on the big tower. Yep. Uh, that was not bad. That was pretty good. Um, and also watched another movie called Barbarian with Justin Long's in it. <clears throat> and it's a really things. weird movie. And the director was saying, he said he, he just went, he just like went, I just started writing a movie. I didn't really have a plan. I just let my key my fingers just did talking. And it's very much that because you don't know where it's going to, where it's going to go and what's going to happen. Um, so yeah, that's kind of cool. Um, so it's, I think it's worth checking out and I think we should do it for uh, the podcast. Mm, okay. I was in cinemas at the moment in the States, I think. I don't know about England, I'm not sure. Um, but it's just really weird. It's this girl turns up, um, this lady, she turns up at a house and it's pouring with rain. And um, the dude that played Pennywise, the new one, oh, um, Stars Bill, Bill Sasgard. He's there and, and it's an Airbnb. And she's like, oh, 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 has this been double booked? And, and she doesn't know what to do. And he's like, well, I'm sorry, I'm here. And he's like, well, I suppose you can come in. So she's a bit like, oh, God, who's this guy? I don't know if I can trust this. And then just things happen from there. They find like a find something in the basement and like a door and things, and just stuff happens. So yeah, it's an inter it's a horror movie, definitely a horror movie. It's like well, as a kid in the eighties, you'd be like a perfect thing on Sky Movies on a Thursday night at ten o'clock or whatever. Mm. Like it's just a horror movie. Um, there's no, I guess. Uh, massive explanation at the end it doesn't completely end the way I want it to that's because it's just kind of just goes out there you can't really guess what's going to I don't think you're going to guess what's going to happen but it's but worth I a think, watch I'd like to know people's opinions on the old uh, social media please 
some of the best films don't really have an explanation. They're like, if you think about some of the random shit we've watched as kids. Oh, absolutely. Some you some know. great horror movies. Are the, if you think about it, like, oh yeah, there's no explanation. They just yeah. There's just the, all of a sudden it's just this the dilemma or situation. I think you can look too much into, um, you know, if you broke down again, going back to something like The Evil Dead. Uh, you know, if you broke it down, you'd find so many plot holes and problems with it. But you, sometimes I think you just need to go with a roller coaster ride, don't you, and just enjoy it. And and it sounds like you enjoyed it. You know, there might have been a few bits. I did. I had, there to, that you... I had to think about it, and uh, it's not. It's, you know, it's good to have a movie that makes you think about it for a little bit. So, um, yeah, worth a watch, I think, if you're a horror fan. And it was good. Like, I Justin hear Long was hilarious. About... He only pops into it halfway through, but it's really funny. Him with a, him with a tape measure, it's very very funny. Oh, hello. Um, Justin I, I Long. Hear... Oh, Actually, I was, where I was sitting in the cinema, we were one seat away from the front of the, the screen's massive, like in Esther Square. And looking up, and I, I said to Mark, Mark, Justin Long's really long. <laughs> he was like, Imagine if Dick Mass was on that screen. But we had to move back. I, I was like, when it fall started, we were right at the front, and I was looked up the screen. And I was like, "Oh my, how are we going to watch this movie like this? This is ridiculous!" And as soon as I started, everyone in the front row just left. And I was like, "Where are they going?" I was like, "They've all gone back there finding seats. Come on, come on, come on!" And, was, and quickly before the movie started, we found some seats at the back. But thank God <laughs> for that. It's just too much. Well, I hear I hear lots of good things. I hear everybody had fun at Fright Fest. So yes, uh, Shri, Shri. Dario Argento was there. Yeah, he was there when um, I turned up. Julian Sands was there. He's getting his photo oh, nice. taken, and I was just like, "Oh my God, Julian Sands!" I had to explain to Mark who was there, and then bumped into some other friends, and I had to explain to them who Julian Sands was. Like, what, what, yeah, arachnophobia. What, Julian Sands. Um, uh, it was funny just seeing him get his picture taken. I was like, "Oh, if Sarah had been there, she'd have been all over him." Um, yeah, I was going to say she, she loves Julian. I mean, I, I don't mind him in Arachnophobia. There's something yeah, it's about him spellbinding. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, well, big thank here? you. Should yeah, we... I was going to say, big thank you to Boz, our fellow bearded podcasting brother, um, for doing this. Uh, we've got a little segment now where he's going to just very briefly break down some of the stuff he's watched uh, and talk about over uh, on Fright Pass. So, yeah, Gav, do you want to let Boz take it away? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, yeah. Then let's jump to Fright Fest where I'm catching COVID <laughs> as we as we listen. <laughs> Live. <laughs> let's get back in time to COVID uh, times. And then we'll be back for our first film. So uh, to stay tuned. Stay tuned. It's Gav here. I'm at Leicester Square. You know, just uh, popped in and I've popped in to, and popped into or uh, bumped in to uh, Boz. I'm with Mark, aren't I, Mark? You are with me. Um, Boz has been here since Thursday. He's exhausted. <laughs> the poor fella's going to go change. home. But before he does, he's going to run the films this year of what he's seen and give us a quick, if you can remember. I'll do, that, as usual, I'll give you my highlights because otherwise it'll be, it'll be a two-hour podcast. And obviously I want you to tune into the podcast under the stairs and listen to that one when okay. I do that. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> well, you should but, round up that. Yeah, if Duncan, Duncan will have me back, I don't know. I'm sure Duncan will. He keeps doing it. He's a fool, that man. <laughs> <laughs> um, Good guys, so, I'm only going to talk about the good things because we're standing ones. in the foyer of we the are, Empire. Of, I know. And if I say something bad about anybody's movie, the, the director the will end up behind me. Because <laughs> honestly, this happened to me too many times at Friday. It's possible. Yeah, so, um, so, yeah, night one, we had Neil Marshall's The Lair to kick everything off. Um, yeah. No. L- listen to the podcast under the stairs to hear more about that. Um, <laughs> and Visitor from the Future is a highlight from that day. Um, yeah. It's a French sci fi movie. People say, oh, how are you going to watch horror films for five days? Sounds the right sci-fi. It's like, they're not, whole, not all horror films. No, that sounds very um, sci-fi. It's a genre festival. You get sci-fi, fantasy, thriller, it's and the crazy. shit that people just have no <laughs> idea who else to show it to. They're like, oh, that Fright Fest lot will watch it, you know. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's kind of one of those. It's it's funny. It's clever. It's got. It's really well made. Um, and, yeah, that, that, that's my pick from that day. Scare Package 2, I watched half of it. And um, walk out. Let her shut up. No, I had to get the last train home. Oh, okay. which, uh, the last tube home. So I See, missed the end of it. Since when have they started like a train? And now yeah, you can hear it in the movie yeah. over the movie when it's playing. It's just slightly annoying. Sounds anyway. awful. Um, if you saw Scare Package One, it's more of the same. It's still that funny. Short film. It, it's sort of an anthology piece, yeah, yeah but with the wraparound. Yeah. And the wraparound was a bit, a bit more silly this time. Okay. Like, um, but for what I saw, it was fun. Yeah, that was in but, Shadow, wasn't it? Scare Package, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was worth checking out. Uh, then the next day, the first film was probably the standout for me, um, which was Next Exit. Called, Again, the, called the standout. 
<laughs> no, what was no, it? Next exit. Oh, right. Next exit. <laughs> it was called the standout. Wow, that's 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 good. Standout film at 10.30 in the morning. Uh, there's quite a few this year, uh, lockdown road movie type movies. Um, um, and written in uh, lockdown. Quite a few, yeah. So it's either a road movie or it's a we're stuck in an apartment movie. Um, some are better than others. This this was the standout road movie. Um, definitely, a, it's a little bit of a spooky element, so you could say it fits in the horror genre, but more of a sci-fi thing. But okay. actually, it's much more of a relationship piece between the next two exit. People. Yeah, it's fantastic. Okay, you got an American lady and a British guy, and he's very British, and he had he uses so many of our little colloquialisms it just cracks you up yeah, it's, so it's funny heartwarming amazing performances can't recommend that highly enough oh cool obviously. okay yeah yeah um, Harbinger was good again I'll probably go in more detail on something else uh, Midnight Peep Show was a lot of fun that was sh- sh- shot gorilla style a lot of it in Soho just over there oh, wow. at 3 o'clock in the morning really <laughs> in piss filled alleys nice yeah, um, but actually, what was it's an anthology piece, but it's three of our UK directors, and um, I'm shit with names, so I'm trying to without it in front of me, I can't tell you. But if you okay. walk past now, I'd follow him because I know what he looks like. Um, <laughs> well, maybe you should stand this way so you can was, see people. I was actually having a really nice chat with him in the Phoenix last night because I wanted to tell him that I liked what they did because what they did, they had their three pieces of the movie, but they had the same DOP and the same crew for all of it. Oh, cool. So the look doesn't change. Yeah, yeah, that's like, good. The wraparound work consistently. Um, yeah, yeah, and it's it's basically about sexual fantasies. What if they go wrong? Um, <laughs> so it, it's a bit cheeky, it's a bit naughty, and it's quite gory in places. So it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's a great Hampshire, midnight movie. Maybe yeah. Ain't gone wrong. <laughs> yeah, um, that's a shit name for a movie. <laughs> All the <a> brilliant name. <laughs> um, Saturday was strong. I thought. Um, Something in the Dirt was the Benson and Moorhead movie. That was their oh, lockdown yeah. movie, stuck in an apartment. But it's them. Very, so, very Cosmo uh, horror. Yeah, and it's them acting in it as well, which is them yeah, yeah, yeah. and Dave, the cameraman. Um, but for what for the, what they were doing and where they were doing it and stuff, um, it's, it's good. It's not going to be for everyone, and it leaves you with a lot of questions. But if you've seen any of their movies, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never come out of one of their movies with an answer. So no, it was no, fine. No. Yeah, absolutely. I, it was fine. Um, Wounded Form was amazing performances, but bonkers. Um, then, uh, Friday, you gone back to Friday? You I'll Saturday. go back to Friday. Sorry, yeah, I'll go back to Friday. <laughs> Lola, that's the one I wanted to talk about. Okay. Lola, everyone needs to see. It's again a sci-fi concept movie sort of thing, but it's shot on 16 mil hand crank. Oh, nice. Some of it, and then blended with archive footage, all okay. black and white. Yeah. Um, and it's a clever time oh, trick oh, kind of movie. Yeah. Fantastic. In four by three. On IMAX, actually looked amazing. Um, the thing I loved is the the, the the old film stock they used because it was so big on that screen. You so could the see grain. The, the grain has got a pattern, and you could see the pattern in it. And then you could tell when they were using that and when they weren't using that because there's nothing that replicates that. Because right. normally you can't see it on a normal screen because it's too small. Yeah, that's, so that's right. kind of fascinating. Yeah, yeah, um, I've been into that. But very clever, very well done. Yes. Yeah. Uh, definitely do that move back to Saturday boss uh, Black Glasses Dario Argento I oh went, he was I, here wasn't he he was yeah I've oh, seen the man himself I've met, I've met Dario here before have you oh, yeah yeah nice. yeah years ago yeah. when he had Mother of Tears oh right I had yeah. a one off Saturday one in November yeah. Screen. That's the first time I've seen him in the flesh. I was like, oh, yeah, no, it's a bit like, oh, oh my god, yeah, the maestro. Science is very for me. Um, but I won't spoil the film. Uh, right? <laughs> was it good? It was. It was Jallo. If you like that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jallo. Yeah, I, it, it was getting on a bit. Yeah, it, it could have been more complicated. Is my main criticism. Okay. Um, but a bit too simple. Yeah, yeah. But that could be spoilery. So we'll just. Okay, let's talk about that. But yeah, it, I didn't hate it. Um, but then my film of the festival, Deadstream. Very good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just made me think of you. <laughs> Why? Deadstream. Why? Deadstream. No, just going into the woods and filming a fucking horror movie. Oh, well, <laughs> so is that it? Yeah, he, the that guy's right? a, the guy's a YouTuber, and he's like, um, he does like mad stunts, and he's like, okay, to redeem myself, I'm going to go into the woods to this haunted house. And I'm just going to be on my own. And the rule is, if it's anything Amazon. weird happens, I have to go and check it out. Oh, nice. And he's basically got GoPro here, GoPro Fail here. Footage. Pocket full of GoPros. <laughs> iPad to manage them all. Like, it's really well done. And he just goes into room, sticks them up. And like, you get, there's like this wooden wall, and he's got like the 3M sticky pad on the back of his <laughs> GoPro. And he's like, puts it up, like, that's not going to stick. Yeah, filmmaker in me, that's not going to stick. He's like, is that going to stick? I don't think it will. This fixes everything. Gaffer tape. Boom. <laughs> Yes! 
no, exactly. That's how you do shit. So it's yeah. a found footage film in the woods. Yeah, but really fucking funny. And sweet. Yeah, it, yeah it's bonkers. It's. I'll, I'll check it out. I like a comedy, as you know. So yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah. the one that stole my heart. Really. I just, again, didn't know what to expect, but it was fantastic. Um, yesterday, <laughs> not the best day. Incredible oh, but no. true was fun. French film about I can't tell you. Just watch it. Incredible but, I guess, but true. Yeah. Um, again, more of a sci-fi thing. Um, really abstract, really odd, but <laughs> funny. Um, yeah. And just a really strange concept that you can't discuss or it completely spoil it. So, okay. Yeah. Right. So, some, some of the films you picked out, they seem to have got quite a heavy uh, sci- sci-fi influence in them as well. Like this year. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Uh, again, main screen, obviously, all the other disco screens has been everything as usual. Um, the price we pay, I skipped to go to the pub. You <laughs> guys, so guys are Oh, okay. Um, and today, I'm guessing Barbarian had to be the filmer today, but I did get uh, to see Terrifier yes. 2. Oh, uh, did you enjoy it? After I did the, dunk, the, dunk, the smackdown with Duncan, where we argued about was Terrifier a good film or not, and I think he won. Um, it will split audiences again, but a lot of the criticisms of the first one was that there wasn't. There was no character development. There was no plot. This time they went, okay, fuck you. Here's two hours and twenty minutes of character development. And oh plot really? Okay. Mixed in with horrendous k- kills, okay. torture, death, and gore. Okay. So um, it's weird, but it's more art the clown. So I was happy. Oh, good. I've not seen the first one. I was just really disappointed they were, they couldn't come because I wanted to meet the guy who plays art. Oh yeah. And just yeah. say, I know your mate Paul Stevenson. <laughs> because he had him on his podcast and they became mates afterwards. So, oh okay. Uh, was yeah. it a good festival? Yeah, always. Yeah. Great. Oh, yeah. no, it's, um, it's great, isn't uh, it? It keeps me coming back every year and spending far no, too much money. I, I've missed it, honestly, I've missed not being here and I sort of chat to the Arrow staff and that, and just seeing the, the lights over there on yeah. the staircase. Obviously, you're listening to this because it's a podcast. <laughs> but there's lights on the staircase going up, Welcome to Friday Fest, the blood comes down, and it's just so it's nice to come back to and see people go, hey, horror movies. <laughs> yeah. All right, everybody. Oh, that was uh, Boz, and that's what he thought. Yeah, sorry, that was a real quick rundown, but they're the ones you should look out for, I think. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Boz. <laughs> no say goodbye. Bye. Thank you very much to Boz, who is a genuine yoga master, light saber wielding swordsman, and fantastic, fantastically groomed beardsman and podcaster for doing that little bit for us there. Now, cheers, Boz. Cheers, Boz. We do love you. Now, this is this is all about RJ McCready, not the RJ McCready from the thing, our friend RJ McCready, and this is his patron pick episode. So I'm gonna. Read out his email now that he sent us uh, before we, we start on our first film. And we're going to be starting with The Lamb That Time Forgot from 1974. But before we do that, as always, thank you to RJ for, for this, for these picks. And here is your email, uh, giving us all a bit of an insight into why he's chosen these two films. Yeah. So it starts with, talking to beards, he starts with, Hello, you bearded podcasting brothers. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Are you going to reply to it all? Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, he says, thank you for covering these two monster classics from that time when Doug McClure was surrounded by more rubber than Jorex. <laughs> <laughs> and a time that I didn't even know what Jorex was. Yeah. So there we go. He says, I was about eight years old. This is a great story. When, when, I, was, when, I, was a, when I was a kid, very quickly, very quickly, when I was a kid, uh, on TV, there's the, the Jorlux dog. Yeah. And I said to my parents, oh, is that a Jurex dog? Oh, God. And I, they're just laughing away, and I just didn't know what's going on. And, and I always thought to myself, why is that funny? Then later on, I was like, uh, yeah. what is the Jurex dog? That's not something. Anyway. I, I don't want to know. Uh, so, I was, he says, I was about eight years old when my dad, who was a TV repairman, bought Warlord, Warlords of Atlantis and Land Before Time. Uh, sorry, the land that time forgot, not the land before time, home on VHS. He said, I can still smell the plastic of the rental boxes and I can hear the sound of that tape rolling in the VHS player. There we go, just conjuring up some good sensual images there. We've all been there. Uh, He says, this all added to the experience I was going to have, which I can only explain as pure escapism. He said, now for the films themselves, and I must admit, I'm saying this with nostalgia, but who doesn't want to watch a movie where a German U-boat finds a lost island inhabited by dinosaurs or another movie where two explorers in a diving bell just come across the city of Atlantis? 
<laughs> I love it. Um, he said, I thought the effects were great for the time, and there were some really nice sound effects, especially in the Warlords with the Gil Swamp Monster, which actually terrified me. Oh, yeah, I agree. Um, some solid characters, some uneasy alliances, which leads me to say about the writing of both of the films. Not only are you entertained by flying piranha fish and that comedic moment where the professor loses his pencil to a sea serpent, which I, I really love and we'll talk about, but there's also some morals of human nature. Who can you trust? There's greed of the sailors when they find the gold, and there's the spitefulness of the second-in-command of the U-boat captain. And he says, the ending of The Land of Time Forgot, and I won't say the next bit, because we'll get to it, but he says, the ending of The Land of Time Forgot is a big sting in the tail. Um, He said, I could go on and on, but in a nutshell, you definitely get your five bucks worth. And I'd actually like to see a remake of both of these films done with a modest budget. Something in the style of Kong Skull Island, which I think is the closest I've seen to these in recent times. We need more films like Warlords, and we need less Jurassic Park sequels. Amen to that, RJ. Uh, Says Gav, I'll be especially interested in your thoughts. And Dan, I think I already know what you're going to say. And then he rounds up the email with, funny enough, after what you've watched... He rounds up the email with love, thunder, man hugs, and everything else. R.J. McCready. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, thanks Thank for that. It's nice to know a little bit of backstory over it. Um, I, I do remember this movie as a kid, a little bit, actually. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, a good one. So, the land that I've got, those. <clears throat> well, we'll have a trailer for it now, uh, and then... Gav can give us a synopsis on it, and we'll get stuck right into the land that time forgot. We'll be back again real soon. Must have been a little after three o'clock in the afternoon that it began. The afternoon of June 3rd, 1916. Fire one. Fire two. (laughs) This could have been the end. The end of just another tragic episode in war at sea. But for the few survivors of a torpedoed merchant ship and the crew of a German U-boat lost in the frozen South Atlantic, It was the beginning of an incredible adventure. For this was the day the 20th century met the primeval world face to face. American International presents The Land That Time Forgot. An astounding motion picture based on the book by Edgar Rice Burroughs, creator of Tarzan and the most thrilling science fiction stories ever written. Travel through an underwater passage and discover an awesome prehistoric world. Fight for your life against the terrifying creatures of a lost continent. Come face to face with primitive man and learn the secret of evolution. The land that time forgot. Mr. Tyler! Starring Doug McClure. There's a secret to this island. Something that we haven't been able to fathom yet. And whether we stay or get away may depend on it. It's action, danger, and adventure on an epic scale. How much longer do we give them? We're not leaving without them! Forget Skipper! You will never forget Edgar Rice Burroughs... The land that time forgot. The land that time forgot, 1974. During World War I, a German U-boat sinks a British ship and takes the survivors on board. After it takes a wrong turn, the submarine takes them to the unknown land of Caprona, Caprona, uh, where they find dinosaurs and Neanderthals. There you go. There we go. It's the first of our Doug McClure double bill. I had also, to. Uh, uh, oh, go on, sorry. What? No, no, you go, go on. Yeah. Um, uh, this was a hard one to find. I was trying to give money to watch this. I, I would go try and find it on Amazon. Could not find it. E, e, uh, oh, did I check YouTube? Hmm. It's not on YouTube. Is it not? Right. Okay. No. Um, so then it's like okay. Um, you know, where can I get it? You'd watched it on Horror Channel? You'd re- yeah, it, luckily, it. both of these movies actually been on the Very Horror Channel lucky. over the last year, and I just happened to have recorded them both. Um, well, so. 
I found um, DVD, uh, but it's a Doug McClure triple bill DVD box set for oh. f- uh, 14 bucks. Um, uh, so I found that off eBay, and that actually also did delay us because I was like, I can't find a fucking film. That was true, yeah. We so that and that COVID well. uh, 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 d- delayed this episode coming out. Um, so I eventually found it, and I only watched one of them today, uh, The Warlords. Um, this movie I do did watch when I was a child. Um, it was I do remember it slightly, but not really m- much, and I, I hadn't really seen it since. It blends into a lot of the Ray Harryhausen sort of movies that I would have watched a lot of as a kid, all the Sinbad movies. It's a shame it's not on Prime, you know. It could get a lot more wider audience nowadays. Yeah, well, I mean, you've seen it on Blu-ray. I, 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 I no, had it on TV. DVD. I was a DVD, but I'm sure it still looked pretty sharp. And, you know, it was really lovely um, print that I've watched on the Horror Channel as well. You know, it's very nice. It's not a worn old VHS or something, but... Before we get into the movie, these both of these two films we're covering today are both directed by the same director, and that's Kevin Connor. Um, Kevin Connor has had a very strange career um, directing th- this type of movie, uh, lots of wizard movies and stuff like that. The People That Time Forgot, which was a sequel. Um, he also did some TV shows like uh, Space 1999. Randomly. He did Motel Hell in 1980, Gav. Oh, okay, no. Yeah, which we should probably cover at some point. Um, The garden-headed people. Yeah, well, he didn't behead them. They buried them in the garden and then slit their vocal cords. Yeah, that's that. Um, Yeah, so very interesting career. um, And he's still directing now, Um, still doing things now. The most recent thing he did was 2017. He's currently got something in the works. So really interesting career. A lot of his stuff he's doing lately though is shit tv movies the sort of movies where it's like a guy moves to a city falls in love with a girl you know these kind of like Paychecks. christmas shit that you get on netflix you know the, the crap i'm talking about Net- a lot of movies on netflix are crap <laughs> there we go um but yeah we aren't talking about those we're talking about the land that time forgot uh, and yeah. this film yeah, I watched this too. Like I said, it did. You know, I, I couldn't have distinguished as a child or as a young man, younger man. I wouldn't have been able to distinguish which, which one was which. There's a lot of these movies where someone ended up back in time or in the centre of the earth or in Atlantis. Very fantastical. You know, they were pushing the boundaries of special effects. They're quite so, popular, weren't they? Yeah, there was dinosaurs and monsters mm. and Simbad the sailor. So whether it was Ray Harryhausen with his incredible stop motion animation, or whether it was uh, you know dressing up a real lizard, or having you know all these uh, plasticine. I used to call these plasticine movies when I was a kid because to me I could tell they were plasticine, but I still loved them. You know what I mean? So, um, and it's got Doug McClure in it as well. So he's a bit of a a classic sort of. He was your B B movie yeah, hero, wasn't he? I don't he? know him from any other films, to be honest with you. But I knew of him, and, and as, soon as, as soon as you said it, I was like, "Yeah, that's that, that, that Doug McClure guy." It's just, I think, it's just because he's been satirised, um, sort of, on The Simpsons. Um, I uh, thought, I thought about watching this uh, with Elijah, um, and I was like, he would, he would appreciate a couple of monster bits, but then he wouldn't pay attention to the rest of the other bits, and then he'd listen to watch some shit on YouTube, and I wouldn't be able to watch the film and review it. So I was just like. I watch it in my own time. It's a shame, but yeah, it's um got a very good likable as a child, like it, like like RJ is saying, this sort of fantasy you could go to another place with it very much so. And it's done in a very, uh, I mean, it's written by. We should definitely mention it's written by uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, who did the novel. Now Edgar Rice Burroughs famously wrote Tarzan. Um, and a bunch of other uh, fantasy and science fiction stuff, uh, very old. And so it's definitely you can feel. Um, you know that, that the the passion that's it's been written with because it takes a long time before anything fantastic happens. It's all it's like a war it's movie all, it's for the very first from dusk till dawn. Yeah, that's exactly how how we described it, isn't it? Um, we've said in the, the switch up, you know, from gangster flick to, to vampire. And it's the same with this. It's a war movie, and all of a sudden it turns into a dinosaur caveman film, and it's just like whoa. And I can imagine. You know, RJ watching this as a child, 
Now, I know he does love his war movies and stuff as well, so I can imagine he was probably really drawn into this, and correct me if I'm wrong, RJ, of course, but I can imagine him really drawn into this. And then when that flip happens, you know, and you would have seen the box art on the DVD or something, but maybe not if it was a rental, I don't know, but you would have suddenly think, thought, holy shit, these guys, there's dinosaurs now and monsters, and what is this? Yeah, if you watch it on TV, well, the land of time forgot is going to give you some idea, and... Um they're going to probably coax the kids in with the, the fact of dinosaurs. I would have thought. Um, yeah, and, and Doug McClure was always around dinosaurs, wasn't he? Speaking of RJ's uh, uh, war uh, films that he likes, I did watch A Bridge Too Far. We did, me and him did speak for it actually a little bit. Um, that was really good. Have you seen that? Yes, very, very good. Yeah, a Really good film. Um, yeah, I, it's funny though, because uh, obviously he said he's interested in my thoughts. I liked the war movie more than when it flipped to the dinosaur movie. I was a bit like, I kind of want the war movie. I kind of liking this. Yeah. I thought the German captain was pretty good, and then having like the sort of bandit re- rebels on there taking over the sub was kind of cool. I, I really liked that part of it. Yeah. It did. It does feel like two spliced together films but I equally I'm a sucker for dinosaurs as well so I really liked that bit too I guess I, at the time obviously it's written at a different point but at the time then I suppose it's not it's not hugely far away in people's minds the war um, it's going to be what 20, 30 years later but still people are going to remember that so having those sort of films it's still going to be relevant I think but then obviously tipping it in with uh, dinosaurs and that stuff as well which is kind of popular at the time and you said it's Amicus obviously Amicus producers yeah, Amicus are going to think well. a little bit outside the box rather than the straight norm so yeah it's interesting you know yeah just um, you mentioned that just to quickly mention to our listeners this is an Amicus film an Amicus production so for anyone who doesn't know Amicus it's kind of like the probably the only other competitor Hammer Horror had really it's like uh, it's like uh, uh, Marvel and uh, uh, DC it is a bit like that, yeah. You're right. Yeah, it's like I, I would say horror. I, I would say Hammer is Marvel. Yeah. They're sort of they were they were much more colourful, and everybody went to see them. And Amicus was like the kind of the the guys in the background. But I still really love a lot of the Amicus. They did a lot of those um, movies where it was like three or four stories in, in one little, you know, a Portman Two, as they would call it. Mm. I mean, have a, we were Sarah and I said we we're gonna have like a weekend of Amicus sometime, just watch a lot of Amicus films. Yeah, because I'm we've not gonna, seen them, so you know. Well, I'm going to do uh, a very quick tangent for this year's 31 Days of Horror. I'm actually yeah. doing 31 Days of Hammer Horror. I've yeah. decided I'm going to do, um, and I'm thinking in a year or two I'm going to do 31 Days of Amicus Horror as well. Okay. Um, uh, just if, to give me. Got that many titles. I don't know if they'll have 31. I will need to research that. Mm. But Hammer was, is going to be a fun one for me because yeah. I'm going to just watch random shit. But yeah, can't wait for 31. 31 come up soon. Excited. Very excited for that. Very Let's excited. get on to this, dude. Let's so, get like, on to that. Right, there's a big, big boat crossing the sea. There is. Some, well, first of all, something is thrown in the water, isn't it? Yes. That's all we know. It's and we will come back to that. Yes. Um, 1916. So we've got this uh, submarine firing torpedo at a ship. Mm hmm. And um, uh, then there's a big, like, uh, obviously there's, there's an explosion. We don't really sort of see it so much. But then there's people in the water, isn't there? And this is where we introduce our main hero. Our main hero. So um, it's 1916, we should mention as well. You know, so this is set a bit before. And there's a lot of. Jumpers with roll necks in this, isn't there, Gav? Yeah, so we're looking good, at good knitwear in this. World War One type. type yeah. Era. Uh, so yeah, we we meet our two survivors of this torpedo uh, blast, and uh, that's Doug. I'm just going to call him Doug. There's Doug, more. There Doug, is more survivors. That we do meet some more in a minute. One of the guys I'm, is from the bill. I'm. Oh yeah, I think I recognise. Um, uh, Doug is what I'm calling him as well. Great. I don't know he's, what his character is in both the films, but he's done. He's called. He's, he's called. He could be. Well, his character could be the Seagal character. He's called Bowen Tyler, but we'll call him Doug. Doug. And Lisa. Where's, right. where's Doug? I like Doug. You see, don't watch The Simpsons. It's when no. Death turns up to one of the old guys in the uh, where Grandpa's in his retirement home, and uh, Doug's. Where, where's Doug? Because home is uh, home is death. And uh, he says he likes Doug. Where's Doug? He's normally normally deaf. Is that the one where they kill Kenny? No. Okay. 
Is that not that show? That's a different show. That's, um, not, that's not a serious question, is it? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> um, so Doug and Lisa, they are stranded after this explosion. Uh, and they're on a boat, and it's foggy. And suddenly they hear... I quite like this bit. Ahoy there! Um, Actually, no, there was no foghorn. And they, they find another boat of survivors and sailors. Hello there! Hello. Quick, have some brandy. Perfect. So they all get some brandy, and they realise they're all lost at sea. They are the only survivors, I the do, last survivors. I do like it all. Oh, sort of the fog, them in rowing boats. It's like, oh, I quite like this bit. It's very cool. I love the way they've done all of this. And there must have been a bit of a budget, because it looks great. It feels great. Yeah, this, the next movie looks, uh, even though it's like 35 millimeter, now, it's, it looks kind of like a TV movie, the next one. I don't know why. The way it's been coloured and stuff, or or not coloured. Um, yeah, they sometimes go over the top with colouring, didn't they, back, back in the day? Oh, I was watching um, uh, the, the, the rowing, uh, the, the Jungle Cruise. I was trying, oh, to, yeah, watch, with I was the trying to watch that. I was going to say to the kids, oh, am I watching that? And I started watching it, and it's the worst colour grade I've ever seen in a movie, that, to the point where I I got off a few and I was like, I'm not watching this. I haven't seen that yet. Um, honestly, watching, you're like, what the fuck? It's the colour is just completely ruined by the colourist. It's like, what have you done? Like, <laughs> like, even someone who isn't technically savvy is going to just sit there and go, is there something wrong with this film? <laughs> I know what it is, though, but I don't like it. It's, yeah, it's a colour. Well, um, I'll check that out. Uh, they um, don't have many provisions. They're stranded in this boat. So you've got, these, you've got Doug, his girl, and or lady, or whoever she is, and uh, a few sailors. A few sailors, a few seamen, and um, Doug, one of the this guys, lady and some seamen. One of the one of the guys, as I mentioned just now, is from the Bill, uh, which the Bill was a police, a British police drama that used to be on twice a week back in the eighties and nineties. I used to stay up late. It was one of the first programs that I used to stay up late and watch. Actually, yeah, why? What was it? Just them getting pe- people in London, just criminals. Just criminals, just always like chasing them down, like, you're nicked, son! Dun, 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 it's great. Dun, 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 dun. Absolutely great. But yeah, so we've got um, we've got these survivors, and while they're sailing along, they hear, they hear a noise. Uh, and, oh my god, it's the German U-boat. So this is submarine, sub- submerging, not submerging, it's going the other way. Rising. I, don't know, I don't know what the opposite of it is. Up-merging. Merging? <laughs> Up-merging. <laughs> It's uh, it's coming to the surface, Ooh. and and as it comes to the surface, the seamen come to the surface. Oh God, we re- sorry about this, RJ. You knew this was going to happen, though. I'm sure Gav's testicles are going to come up at some point. I don't know how. I don't know they, at what point they, they're going to come up unless you bring oh, it up. There's know. nothing in my notes about my nuts. All right, well that, that's cool. My nut nose, my no nuts. We ended up talking about um, Kevin Bacon's bacon for ages in the last episode. So, um, so. Yeah, that's just your weird thing that where you you mentioned multiple times about Kevin Bacon, his body and his his lump from his. He's got, he's got, he's yeah, packing but, bacon. It's still like quite weird, like you it's brought up and multiple times, and it yeah. was in your notes. You'd literally written down the words Kevin Bacon and his knob shape and stuff. Yeah, not in those specific no, words. I'm, I'm a meticulous. I'm a meticulous podcaster, Gav. Okay, but right. you want to watch Kevin Bacon in 3D, don't you? Jesus, imagine that. I'd, my leg would be shaking up and down like that kid that you were. <laughs> now then, anyway, so they're very they're very brave because when this U boat starts up merging, they're just it? like Doug's just like right. That's it. We're gonna go fucking get over there and yeah. we're gonna jump up there as soon as they come out. She's fucking have it and we're gonna go in there and fucking take a submarine. That's what they say. Yeah, is it? Fucking, fucking have, it. have it and we're gonna take a submarine. What do you mean you could take a submarine? I know. We don't know how many people. You could just jump down the ladder and go, right, that's it, everybody. He I'm says, in charge. He says, look, so I know these U-boats because I've worked on them and I, I think he, his dad used to build them or, or something. He knows them very well and he's like, look, I know how to do this. Let's just do it. And he does. So they... It's literally, don't think, don't get anxiety, don't, don't even contemplate what's going to happen. Let's just go to the hatches on a submarine which could go back down in the water. But that that was the British stiff upper lip, really, I guess, wasn't it? And, and obviously Doug is, Doug's Churchill American approach. as well. But, and then they've got, even Lisa gets stuck in. She's like, yeah, I'll have a go. I'm, I'll fight these Germans. So they have a big scrap. I really like this fight, actually. 
you know, every time a German, it's like whack-a-mole, a German pops his head out one of the hatches, he gets smacked with a, an oar or a paddle, and they, they, they capture the captain. They the captain. Big, big punch up. Lisa manages to shoot one of them. Um, a couple of people end up in the water, and they, they take over the U boat. Yeah. Um, you know, and they, they make the demands, you know, here's Pretty what was going to happen. Impressive, really. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you've got Doug McClaw on your team, Gab. Would you, if me and you were with Doug, it's just me, you, and Doug. There's a load of brandy in a boat. We're pretty, oh, great, we're really it? drunk. And he's like, hey, guys, hey, look at that submarine. Let's go. And, uh, I know we both look at each other. Fucking do we do it? Fucking all right, go on then. I think if Doug McClure told me to do it, especially after a bottle of brandy, I probably would do it. Yeah, oh, I'd fall into the water and drown, probably. I'd, I'd die of Absolute I'd useless. He'd look back, come on, guys. And there's just us going, help, help. I mean, you know I can't really swim, so... <laughs> I wouldn't really be much good in this situation. Help, are you asking me to help you? I don't even drink, and you've made me drink brandy in the ocean. <laughs> so there's, there's something bad happens though, because they take over the, the U boat, and they sort of say, you know, this is the deal. We, we're we're in charge now. But while that's happening, they get fired at by a British ship who sees a German U boat and obviously thinks, "Quick, there's the enemy." Let's. You know, that shit. We, yeah. They don't know Doug McClaw's in it. No, they don't. They've, and they're um, cut off with communications. Um, and the idea is, obviously, Doug's going to like, I'm just going to get you guys to a UK port. That's what we're going to do. Um, yeah. And um, they'll take you from there sort of thing, which is very, very... Commandeering a, a sub is very impressive. I hope he gets a little medal for that, because that's like, fucking hell. Well, they dive, dive, and they spend six days... Uh, and they've not spotted a single ship yeah. in, in the whole time. They... But, but then, obviously, like you say, they, they, they see this British sub, and, um, British uh, warship, sorry, and it fires on them because, obviously, they're German. Now, the reason they don't spot anybody for six days and they find out they've been going in the wrong direction is because one of the Germans, one of the baddies, has put a magnet next to the compass. Yeah, they're not... Like I've got to say, I'm very impressed by them. They weren't angry when they pulled the compass off. And oh, he's, he's had a compass on it like that. They weren't, didn't turn around and smack him, which I thought no, was good. What they they just said, oh, well, that's six days wasted, isn't it? Bloody hell. Well, I'm quite shocked later on. I will get to it when they're not very surprised by dinosaurs. <laughs> OK, can't wait to hear that. So what their plan is, Doug, quick, he thinks on his feet, Doug. He says, look, here's what we'll do. If we've been going in the wrong direction for six days, we'll just go to South America instead. It's fine. Change your plan, guys. We're going to South America. But the Germans regain command because they, they pull some guns, they smash the, the radio, and the Germans are back in charge. Now, the goodies do fight back a bit. And, and, and when they got fired by that British ship, that's why they submerged again, didn't they? They went back down because yeah, it's like we got dive. fucking. Out. And that's when all this is what you just said happened, right? Gotcha. And they come across some icebergs. Yeah, and uh, this, this come on. Would you? Right, me and you. I think we're going to spend this episode of this this particular film just putting you and I as, as the seamen in the scenario. <laughs> we're scenario seamen, all right? Yeah. Um. Uh. So. Dan, right, me and you are the captains, I don't know how, we're just like, we're like, yay, we're both captains, we're like crisscross, and we can have our trousers backwards and everything, right? <laughs> so there's a fucking ice, iceberg coming up, a massive one, right? Yep. What do you want to do? Do, look, I think, if we go down, there's a tunnel, we can sort of go into that. I'm going to say to you, let's not do that, because we don't know... <laughs> What's down there, and it could be just fucking ice. This so are you, very, are you saying to me, very daring to do? Are you this? saying to me, if we were trapped with seamen, and there was a tunnel that you didn't want to go in, we're in a massive tub of seamen, and you don't want to go in my tunnel <laughs> into this ice tunnel because my, you don't know if you're going to get blocked. But stop trying to get all funny with it. it you're going to get blocked by ice. Right? It's just such a daring manoeuvre. It's a sub. It's not exactly like it's okay. Cool. Let's just do a three-point turn and go out the other way. It's fucking massive. It's a submarine tube. You know. Like, so, Jesus. so so let's circle back. So yes, they find the ice. The ice. And what do they, they do? 
they ask the Germans for help, and the Germans say, "Look, all right, we will, we will help actually, because we're fucked. We're really lost. Yeah, here. Everybody's fucked. Basically, there shouldn't, there shouldn't be any ice around here. Don't you think but, submarines are the most scariest places to be? I'd shit what... myself in one. Would you not? It's just like I, I'd quite like to go in one. I've been in a semi-submersible in Australia, but I've never been in a fully, sub, you know, submarine. You've been in a semi, not but not a full. <laughs> God, see, you're being silly now. <laughs> Keep your seeming to yourself. So um, they ask the Germans for help, and they're sort of looking around, and the, the Germans do discuss this legend of a lost or new continent that was discovered by somebody called Caprona, um, and that's what that's. And he says they he named the continent Caprona, the land of Caprona, and they said I think that what we're looking at over there could well be Caprona. This could be it. Um, the water is fresh. The water is warm. Um, and this is where they see this huge cave with a tunnel in it. And they, you're right. They say, my my notes are terrible here. They enter the tunnel. It's very tight. I put. Um, and as they were making their way through this tunnel, and like you say, you're right, Gav. You know, they blindly go into this tunnel, but in a very long tube. It's not. It's not like they're in the Millennium Falcon flying through the meteorite shower. But they do go in. They hit a few rocks, but they do make it out the other side. Up periscope. Let's take a look around. Yep. Dino- dinosaur comes flying at the uh, periscope. <laughs> Straight away. Straight away. What the fuck was that? I don't know. I saw something. I don't know what it was. Well, let's go and have a look. So they all get out the hatch. I still think, though, like, an incredible thing of just one person pilots a submarine has the life of all those people like, in this container of air under the water. It's scary. It's like being a captain of a plane, though, right? It's very scary. The, he, Doug McClure's lady, Miss Miss Clayton, she she what? She's been put up in the the uh, captain's quarters. Very old-fashioned, sexist, isn't it? What has she got? What is she in the quarters? What is she with everyone else? She's a lady. Yeah. Do you think the captain, German captain, is going to try and get some German sausage in there? <laughs> Broad Maybe. First. Maybe. Would you like to go down on my U-boat? Athena. <laughs> Come on. Take a look. Dive, dive. Um, so, uh, apologies to your German. But yeah, it's like this tremor type thing just flies at the periscope when he looks through it. And he's like, yeah. whoa! This is like, yeah! Whoa, indeed! Like, you don't know where the fuck you are. And there's this creature thing's done that. Like, the, 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 the calmness of these guys discovering these creatures from prehistoric times is astounding! <laughs> Exactly. So let's let's do that. So they come out the hatch. And they go up they, on deck, so they don't see they? Straight away, what do they see? There's oh, dinosaurs. Look, there's a, oh look, that's a um, brachiosaurus over there. That's they, the reaction. That is it. If I says, saw a dinosaur, I'm going to react different than that. He says that's hot. They should have been extinct for millions of years. Hmm. Yeah, that's it. That is it. Like the direct. Come on, director. Get get, get to another take. Let's just get a little bit more emphasis out of them. This is quite incredible thing. What's sure. that over there? That's the pterodactyl. Ooh. Just flying right. Are you sure, Professor? Fucking calm as shit. Absolutely. Yeah. They're in the next movie as well. Calm as shit in that too. Atlantis. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's just like, oh, look at this um, place where so, all you silver-headed warriors. So this is like Jurassic Park, essentially. Um, now, one guy's eaten straight away by a creature. It's amazing. So, like, get back in. Get back in. <laughs> and there's quite a bit of blood, actually, here. Yeah. For, you know, what would have probably been a PG movie... Is a bit of blood. Um, <laughs> my note: Dinos- Go up on deck. Dinosaurs eaten by dinosaur. Shoot a dinosaur. <laughs> Doug McClure does <laughs> shoot a dinosaur. Oh, this is brilliant. Right here, right, what, right. We apart from the fact we're not shocked in any way or phase that there is dinosaurs now back in existence. Not phase at all. I've I've killed one and I've chopped some up, and our chef's cooking it up for us right now. We're so, going to eat it. We don't even know. It, we don't know what sort of what like, diseases this could have. We're just going to eat this meat. Yeah. So it cuts from Doug McClure shooting it to dinner is served, and he's what's it? Plesiosaurus. Let's get stuck into this Plesiosaurus. Here is more calm as shit. These guys for the first time ever. No one's probably ever done this. A eating dinosaur. So I'm sitting there watching the guy on the left going, come on, 
What's your reaction going to be to eating dinosaur? She puts it, puts it in. Like, surely you'd be like, fucking hell, I'm eating a dinosaur. That's incredible. Like, surely everybody sitting around this table should realise how fucking incredible this is. Now, what does he do? He eats bit and goes, hmm. And then just starts talking about what's going on. Not do, any talk about dinosaurs. What do you think the dinosaur would taste like? Pig chicken. Because I've had alligator uh, and croc or crocodile, crocodile alligator in Australia. Chicken, isn't it? Uh, really, it wasn't crocodile. Is what I had in Australia, and it wasn't. It was just, it was like really nice. I thought it would be a bit fishy for some reason, but it wasn't. So I should imagine it would taste a bit like crocodile. It's a bit beefy. But yeah, the, but this is a, a, a metaphor. This dinner now is is a metaphor because what this allows is conversation to open up. Not and about the dinosaurs, though. In not fact, about they're eating them. Not about dinosaurs. Not no. in the slightest. But what they talk about is a truce. German captain says, "I think," uh, and every time they said his name, I laughed, and I don't know why, because his name is Captain von Schordenwoods. <laughs> And every time they said it, they said they would say his full name. They wouldn't just go Captain or. Are you thinking of the Sh- Schwartz? Uh, uh, the Schwartz from uh, the, the Spaceballs. Space but every time they said it, they'd be like, "Oh, excuse me, Captain von von Schwartz." Yeah. I, I I would say if if a German guy came and said, "All right, I think we should," uh, I'm not putting an accent. There. Um, uh, I think we should do a truce, whatever. I'd be like, "No, uh, I, I can tell you what." This whole fight and war thing doesn't matter anymore because I'm eating dinosaur. This is a lot more important than us, t- our countries fighting each other. It's completely We're irrelevant. We're eating a dinosaur. I'm eating a dinosaur. They it could have been the last us. one. I'm eating it. Yeah, but it could have been the last plesiosaurus ever. How long do you keep it for? Three days in the fridge until it goes off? Make make a curry out of it. It'll last longer. Oh, what if you're then sick? Like, bleh, dinosaur. Bleh. Pooing out dinosaur. You never thought you'd be pooing out dinosaur, did you? I hope you vegans listening. I do apologise. So they 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 say yes, okay, truce. While we're on the island, a truce. There's a lot more going on than on this island than than there is between our countries. Let's. And we're not not about the dinosaurs before you say because I can see <laughs> they don't care about eating dinosaurs. It's the island that they care about. It's, it's incredible. So they get they get. Let's go for a little stroll. So the whole continent, they realise, well, they, they go for a stroll, and they, they realise this whole continent, you know, could be could be in a giant volcano. This is crazy. So they have a look round. they got an- another another encounter. Cavemen. Brilliant. Um, and they hunt them while they hunt a dinosaur. They take a caveman on board with them. Why? Why do they fight the cavemen? Why do they kidnap a caveman? don't know. Why did they take the caveman with them? Well, they save him from a T-Rex or some giant monster. And he, anyway. he kind of just becomes their sort of like, oh, I'm your mate now. Well, he, so they shoot it, they kill it, this T-Rex, and the caveman wakes up and he says, Bolo! Bolo! Yeah, for and some... they're like, what are you saying, mate? Funny enough that he's... Bolo! That word he says is very well pronounced, funny enough. It's very well British as well. It's the most British-sounding caveman ever. Bolo! Bula. And it's like, oh my oh, god, so, so British, that caveman. Uh, so they're like, look, I don't know, I don't know. he's trying to warn us about something. Let's just take him back to the submarine. Yeah. Now I've, this, I, have put... this, I love this bit. Like, like, they should be really phased now. We're on a submarine now with a caveman. Eating. We're in a submarine and a caveman. I'm going to offer him dinosaur. some dinosaur from yesterday's <laughs> leftovers. He'd be used to it. He'd be like, yeah, I, I eat this all the time. I mean, with a caveman and, and a submarine. Now, the, my next statement is quite cruel. Okay? You look at this, a caveman, and his IQ. So, no, no, no. So the caveman, obviously, is an actor in, in a lot of makeup to make him look like he's got a bigger brow and a fur, like a no, big nose and everything, yeah? <laughs> this caveman looks exactly like the actor John C. Riley. From you know, Step Brothers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Holmes and Watson, <laughs> which I watched fairly recently, and yes, I actually found it quite film. amusing. Be- oh. I went into it going, "This could be awful." Found it quite funny. Uh, good, I'm glad. I, I really didn't like that. I don't know but, how. but the caveman looks like John C. Riley. Just leave that to sit for a bit. Now he knows about fire because 
they 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 show him fire and they're sort of toying with him a bit. And they say, oh, if he knows about fire, then he might he might know what oil is, and oil is fuel, and we need fuel for the submarine. So this is good. Let's. Uh, his name's Arm, by the way. A H M. Arm. Arm. So. Uh, yeah, he's he's a, so he, they say to him, take us to your fire or your your oil or whatever it is. I don't know how they communicate so quickly with him, but they do. <laughs> and uh, they take so he takes them off. But as we've seen before in lots of movies, he gets to a certain point and he won't trespass any further. Mm-hmm. And they say, oh, that's because there's probably another tribe. And they work out that there's three tribes. There's Arms Tribe. Then there's a tribe above them that are a bit sort of more intelligent. And then there's the uh, really super duper intelligent tribe that they all aspire to be. So they think they're going to evolve. What's that noise? Uh, It wouldn't be on the microphone. Okay, sorry. Super duper tribe, very intelligent people. So there's three tribes. I was no. looking at pictures, by the way. That's what the sound was. That's fine. You're trying to find John Come, C. Riley. No, no. I was looking at pictures of um, uh, of the film as you're going through. Uh, so, another tribe sneaks up on them while they're asleep. Yeah, they're attacked at night time. And they fend them off. But they two two more of their men die. Two more seamen fall to the ground. Seamen um, all over the ground. But luckily, the next day, they do find oil and fire which is great because they they're going to set up i'm jumping ahead a little bit here so this is more for me gav this is more mind-blowing than the eating a dinosaur is it it's the killing of the uh the dinosaurs no 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 for me just and i'm jumping ahead we'll come back to it properly in a minute what their plan is to do is to set up an oil refinery yeah on this lost island so that they can refine oil and turn it into fuel for the submarine. Yeah, how long are they just casually, on this? Let's just refine some oil. Um, yeah, they, they find these, these nesting dinosaurs. They do. Well, there's a dino fight between an Allosaurus and a Triceratops, and the Triceratops wins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, because it's got horns. But they get past it and they get away. And they, and they find these nesting dinosaurs, so they just decide to start shooting them. Why? Why does Doug McClaw want to kill it? I don't know, and it's really sad. So the daddy dinosaur just goes, fuck this, I'm out of here, and just leaves mummy dinosaur to get shot. And it's like, they're just nesting. And Doug McClaw and the German captain, they actually go off and hunt it. Yeah. The others will go, he says to the others, oh, why don't you all go back to the submarine? Uh, me and the German captain will take care See? of this. See, sounds like Bruce Campbell. He is, he is. He says, me and Captain von Schwarzenbots will take care of this. Yeah. So they all go back, leaving Douglas and the captain to hunt this, follow it down. Um, the, the, but luckily, the submarine says, well, join in, actually, Doug. What we'll do is we'll fire our cannon at the dinosaurs. <laughs> so their cannon starts blasting these dinosaurs. It's just, uh, like, it's, it, it's just man all over, isn't it? Let's just turn up to an area and just start blowing it up because we can let's refine oil <clears throat> yeah let's, let's, suck, let's the, kidnap, suck the oil out of the ground kid, kidnap the natives and, uh, and know, shoot them everybody a bit, absolutely kill the wildlife. yeah is this what and this that, message is that is i think that is it for me that is what i took away from this um for sure uh what's sad about that bit where the cannon blows up the dinosaurs is the surviving dinosaur just sort of walks off into the jungle looking bit visibly bit really sad about his a family just being wiped out Imagine when uh, uh, was it? It's Ray Harryhausen that did this. Wasn't it? it wasn't Ray Harryhausen. Yeah, but it's very much like no. it. So it's ima- like that. imagine like the person had to do this. Goes, oh great! So I'm just having walking off slowly. Yeah, the, the director's notes are like, so I want this dinosaur to walk away having lost his entire family. Um, so he's walking very sad and dejected into the into the forest. And the the animator's like, okay, yeah, I'll make sure I do that. So they so they go adjacent to the river, and they as they follow the river, they're discovering in they're taking their samples of the water, and they're, they're finding the microorganisms are, are simpler and lesser as they further they go up the river. So they feel finding like, oh, okay, so there's going to be a certain point where there probably won't be dinosaurs. I guess is their assumption. 
Yeah, because what they realise is that all errors, just Jurassic, Triassic, and all, uh, Crustaceous, all the errors are all happening at the same time at the opening bit where they. So literally, every point of evolution is happening at the same time. But the further up the river you get, you're right, Gav. They it's less and less and less and less and less. Um, so the water is kind of undrinkable at this point because it's got too many microorganisms in it. But they know further up they go, the cleaner the water is going to be. But also, there's going to be more pure organisms as well they also i don't know at what point they must be back on a ship for my note to say this um or back on the sub at some point they um they oh because they're on the sub anyway aren't they going upstream is that what yeah going? yeah, okay, yeah they're saying like, along yeah so this there's so many first in this it's like oh my god there's dinosaurs oh my god we're eating dinosaur oh my Fuck god we've kidnapped a caveman <laughs> right now it's a new one Caveman's now a DJ. We've now on a submarine with a caveman <laughs> DJing. Caveman doesn't know what this stuff is, and caveman's now DJing. <laughs> I just want a bit of this party game. Where's where my dinosaur record? burger? And, he... and can I get drunk on the brandy while I dance to the caveman DJing? Is this where he sort of moves the record and it's sort of. <laughs> and he's putting on records. I was just like, what's going on here? And he starts sort of like chugga, 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 scratching on I it. actually think none of them went to this place at all, and Doug McClure was by himself in a park with a head full of acid. Or Doug McClure was the only survivor with a crate of brandy, yeah. and he's drunk himself. And he's, on a, he's actually on a rowing boat, delusional from the sun, <laughs> drunk, and this, is, this whole thing is in his head. That would be amazing if that was the ending. I actually want that to be the end of the film. That would be fucking amazing. I'm going to make that into the end of a movie. Do the most ridiculous movie ever and just have that. So, as mentioned previously, they, they start building their oil refinery now, which, you know, just very casually, <laughs> let's just get an oil refinery on. So all these Germans and all these um, British guys and Doug McClure, have, you know, wait, club and, together. Wait for Caveman to be walking by in background with a hard hat on and high-vis and still toe caps with a, with a hammer and a tall pole. And blow like, Caveman's um, now a builder. A load of bricks and a heart just walking along on his shoulder. Oh, hey, um, can you put those bricks over there? Oh. Great, nice one, thanks, mate. The evolution what have we got of the your caveman. Today? The, the speed oh. of the evolution of this caveman is incredible. And then the whistle, the break goes whistle, guys, dinosaur sandwiches. Next week, next week, caveman. There, next week's like making rockets for the moon. I figured this out. You've spoke. You speak so fantastically as well by now. So. Um, they are realising that it's more and more advanced and pure organisms as they go upstream. We've talked about that. Um, we have a very homoerotic moment where for no reason at all, a German and a British get into a fight in the oil pit and they get all oiled up and they're rolling around, having a good old scrap. It's not really got much to do with the um, what's going on in the plot. It's just an excuse to see two grown men fighting in oil. Um, uh, they they meet other cavemen, don't they? And the well, caveman, their caveman pet, is uh, is just goes, oh, I'm not a DJ, I'm one of you guys. Well, they sort of use some weird telepathy, it seems, because they sort of call to him. It's time for you to join our tribe and move up a step stage of evolution. <laughs> now. So he's called by them into the woods by the other tribe. Which but is he, weird. He, he, okay, after this then, he goes off into another tribe. They, they're, they're just going to be talking about the same old shit. Oh, I might be doing so over there. Hope I'll get something tomorrow. Cool. I'm going to bash the wife over the head later and have sex with her at uh, will because I'm a caveman. Just the normal everyday conversations that they have. And But he's going to be like, music! I was a DJ! Like, I've been on a, a, a vessel underwater. Like, he's going to have stories, and they're going to be to the point to shut up. I'm so bored of you talking about the, the, the music in the submarine. Oh, guys, I helped build an oil refinery. Shut up. We don't care. Like, I, I was actually what a What the fuck is an oil refinery? <laughs> yes. I don't even know what it is. I lived with all these people for years. Like, what, what is a we final don't record care. player? Don't care. Stop it. I, hate, I wish Bob would fuck back off with those other weirdos. So they they come across our heroes, the uneasy alliance between the Germans and the Brits and Doug McClaw. Uh, they come across the third tribe, the most advanced tribe, and they are all floating about in the pool. All the women are in the pool. 
and they figure out that these women are essentially their hormones, their eggs are washing downstream. In the, well, this is how they describe it. They're washing <laughs> downstream. So they're basically, they're shagging in this pool, and these men and women, and all their DNA and everything is going downstream and basically creating life all the way through this whole entire continent. River orgy. So it's like a giant hot tub orgy, basically, is mm. the reason that, you know, these dinosaurs exist. So they're semen. <laughs> it's all about semen. It started with semen and it ends with semen. Yep. So that's the source of all life. But while they're realizing this, they are attacked by a tribe. They use spears. They use boomerangs, um, which is very advanced. Good weapons, good boomerang. You don't see many boomerang kills. Good to see those. Um, they kill some of our goodies as well. Um, all of a sudden, well, we're in the middle of this, and rather annoyingly for the good guys, Pterodactyl flies down, grabs one of them, flies off with it. Yeah. A bit annoying. But they're not, like, they're not phased as normal. They're not phased. Oh, it's a, yeah, it's a pterodactyl. Um, Doug and Arm um, are attacked by the, the pterodactyl, and Arm is killed by it. So he's DJ. He lived. He had a short life, but I like to think it was a, an action-packed life. Kind of. To be honest, that t- today was the most hectic, busy day he's ever had in his life. He was kidnapped. He's leaving the DJ's. Join another join another squad at the end and then got taken off by a pterodactyl we don't even know what happened to him we don't know if he died he might have just lived now as a pterodactyl or like or he had it as his flying pet I like to think of him as an oil refining pterodactyl DJ incredible pterodactyl Cave, DJ man. that's a good name for a DJ actually pterodactyl DJ yeah, that's not bad bit of a mouthful um, so Lisa is kidnapped and the men start fighting over these cavemen and we know what they want here they see her, she's fresh meat, and we know that they want to breed. So they all start fighting over her. But while this happens, an avalanche, very handy, an avalanche volcano, goes off. Volcano, isn't it? Well, it's the start of the volcano. It starts with an avalanche, and mm. then the volcano starts going. Now, is this because, and I think it is, if I'm reading this right, because they start, they start digging in and refining the oil and changing the landscape by killing animals? More than likely. The, 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 the land is like well hang on I'm going to have a volcanic eruption here because you guys are coming along and you're fucking up you know this continent a bit like global warming now yes it, 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 I think this whole message of this film like you say is pretty much uh, uh, just now <laughs> um, Lisa escapes and is chased um, and the U-boat says look we're going to have to go because this whole island is going to explode they, do, well, uh, they did fall in quicksand didn't they the caveman and um, Lisa or is it Lisa it is Lisa, yeah. yeah. They fell in quicksand at one point, but they got out. Um, but yeah, everything's on fire, and uh, yeah. Yeah, it's um, like a swamp, isn't it? Submarine Dug, can't Dug's... submerge because it's actually too hot, so the pressure would be too much on the submarine. Well, Doug goes back to save Lisa from the swamp that she's sinking in. Um, but this is where raining, we get fireballs raining down everything's from the sky. Everything's on fire. Literally, the whole planet, dinosaurs. Um, Doug fights um, the final tribe, who are called the. Galu, Galu, and yeah. he fight he fights the final tribe like the final boss in Streets of Rage. Um, the ground starts cracking open though, but there's more fire, there's lava, there's fireballs. They make it back to the oil refinery, <laughs> their camp, but there's no one there. They've left. They've all got on the submarine, and the Germans are like, "We're gonna have to go. We're gonna have to go. Fuck your friends." And the Brits are like, "Look." If I know Doug McClaw, he'll be here on time. Presumably they're taking as much oil as they've been able to uh, take. They've come and sucked what they need out of the land. And just, like, let's fucking just get going and just see how far it gets us, I suppose. The whole place is on fire, like you well, say. we fucked it up. Let's move to another place and we fuck that one up. You keep seeing dinosaurs dying. There's fire. There's yeah, fireballs. Basically, they've gone there and destroyed the <laughs> land. <laughs> That's awful, isn't it? They've killed loads of animals and then set off these explosions and gone. See you later. So on the other side, on the on the side of the riverbank, Doug and Lisa are running. They see the U-boat and he's like, "Hey, wait, wait!" And uh, they are sp- they're going to wait, but Dieter, the Dietz, the German, is very impatient. He's the second in command, and he says, "No, we're not waiting." He shoots a bunch of people. 
and he orders the rest of them that get down in the hatch we are getting out of here right now so they do the captain gets quite cross captain von schoenwurz <laughs> It's very cross that they're leaving uh, Doug and Lisa. But the sub is full of smoke and they can't breathe. Let's dive, dive, dive. No, we can't dive because if we die, like you said, with the pressure cap, but the captain dies, they all die. My notes here say the submarine is fucked. <laughs> yep. So actually, Doug and Lisa were better off not getting on that sub. Yeah, and they're off to go off and just have a little party to themselves. The submarine just blows up. Yep. And that's it. Uh, Lisa and Doug, they watch the whole thing. Doug's basically going off for a shagathon, because what else are they going to do? Well, they've got to restart mankind on this continent, haven't they? She's going to be like, well, I'm pregnant now. You don't need to have sex with me anymore. So, what? Well, they wake up the next day and they realise that they're alone. <clears throat> but he says, we are alone. But we are in love. I guess you could say we're married of sorts. And this is where he writes his journal about them exploring this continent, he's walking gonna, through the he's, ice. He's going to explore her continents. Oh, yeah. He's going to make her... Anyway, um, I was going to come up with something then, but tectonic plate shift. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> this is what? That is just random. <laughs> um, and what we see is the very beginning, the, the, the message that was thrown into the river is actually Doug's journal. He's written this journal all about this lost continent, and he throws it into the, to the river. And that's what the note is. That's, that's the what beginning. the note is. So, a couple of things to... A lot to unpack here. But essentially, yes, it is Dust Till Dawn in a way. It's a, it's a war movie, uh, you know, a World War One war movie that turns into a dinosaur fantasy adventure. That's number one. But the big thing really is, this is an environmental message in 1974, which is quite, you know, quite ahead of its time to deliver such a strong message, which is basically, mankind might fuck the planet up a bit. Fast forward to 2022, where we're getting like 40 degree heat waves followed by flooding the next day, I'd say we might have fucked the planet up. Yeah, I've not had the chance to eat dinosaur. No, I've not had dinosaur yet. Would you have dinosaur? <laughs> To eat or to sleep with? To eat. What did we, didn't we have this discussion that lot we were talking about last time? It was. It's woolly mammoth. It's woolly mammoth. A woolly mammoth burger. If they're bringing, because they're bringing, they're trying to make woolly mammoth for That's true. what restaurant? I, I, I'd eat dinosaur. Depends if it's a right, I suppose. Yeah, I don't know. Mm. Maybe. I think there's some dinosaurs that would be good. I think like a Velociraptor is quite um, quite muscly. Probably wouldn't get a lot of good meat off of that. But I think like something big, like a T-Rex. Imagine a T-Rex leg on your on your table to share with your family. It's too big. You can't have that. It's huge. Yeah, but a big family it might be all right. Rump steak. <laughs> a giant Diplodocus rump steak. Just a giant butt cheek the size of your whole table. What um, do you like this film? I love this film. I think this is pure. Uh, he, he summed it up. RJ summed it up. Pure escapism. Yeah. Uh, it's of its time. A very innocent time. Um, but, but what I like about it is it's an innocent film. It's written by Ed, Edgar Rice Burroughs. You've got to remember that as well. And I don't know if I've never read that original novel, so I don't know if the message about environmental, you know, stuff impact was in that original novel but I love the fact it's in this film and it drags here and there, yeah okay, and it's got some silly bits in it, it's just, it just makes you feel like a kid watching it again what about you? Uh, yeah, it was um, it was interesting going back into it because like, I, I did watch it as a kid Didn't um, I've never been really huge into my fantasy and uh, prehistoric stuff Um I'm just not, you know, not really my sort of thing. Um, I, I enjoyed it for uh, what it is. Um, it's definitely one of those films, like, I imagine like, if I was like RJ and I'd seen it multiple times or I'd had it on videotape, I would have just watched it multiple times because that's what we did because we didn't have such a choice like you'd have nowadays. Um, I think I'd been like, yeah, there's such a sentimental value to this. But it was, it's enjoyable for what it was. It's, it's quite impressively made in places. Um like I said, I like the first half of the film, and I'd like to have seen that movie more because I, I actually thought that was really good dynamic. I thought that German 
officer or captain was really well cast. I thought he was good. I liked the fact that he had a very British sensibility to him, the way he was very polite. And like the way he put up the lady into his quarters yeah. and stuff. Like that. I thought it was very gentlemanly, actually. Um, and I really liked that whole thing. And I was wondering what dynamic you could do with that if that was just the film itself. You could have turned Doug McClure into the bad guy. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and you know what? And Doug McClure gets given a bad bad rep a lot because well, he's a cheesy, like but actually he was good in this. Isn't like Simpson, so you know. But I think he was very good in this. Um, and you're right. All the casting was good in this. And what I think was made this really was how seriously everybody took it. You know, they just did this like a very straight faced. It wasn't tongue in cheek. It was. It wasn't supposed to be funny. It was just full on. This is happening. Let's deal with it. Okay, yeah, you're right. When they came across dinosaurs, they were very chilled. <laughs> oh, it's a dinosaur. Then again, that is kind of, <clears throat> in some ways, though, you, as a child watching that and not having a reaction like they should have, does make the film more a film and more a fantasy. Do you know what I mean? It yeah. makes it more of like it's make believe. We know it's make believe. We know what's going on here. So. Um, so I'm just looking at it in that way, realism. You don't need that. It's, it's not supposed to be like that. They know what film they're making. And yeah, I, I'd, am I going to recommend it? Don't know. Um, possibly if you're into those sorts of films. I'd, I'd recommend it. You know it what like you're going to watch. A cosy Sunday afternoon film. You could, I think you could. You'd be like, oh, it's on Channel 4. Or do you know where you flick the channel on TV on and it was on or something? I don't watch TV anymore. But, you know, you could easily probably just go, yeah, let's watch that. For, for me, it's in the same vein as Jason and the Argonauts, Sinbad. Christmas they, time, maybe. Yeah, I love those sort of films. Watch it in the morning. You know, Eating of the chocolates in the morning, so that much. Watching the land that Tom forgot, just for the, just for slippers. kicks. Yeah. <laughs> so you go. know, I think in that sense, definitely. But it's not saying. It, it, to be honest, so you're gonna you're gonna struggle to find it to watch it. <laughs> That's very true. Unless, so I don't know. You, unless you catch it on like the horror channel or, or, or you or, or you or find find the only copy, which happens to be a box set. Luckily, with both the films in uh, on eBay. If you're lucky to do that, which I did, one copy. Amazing. Apart from that, fuck knows. Yeah, it's strange. Strange that it's not readily available. Um, but there we go, Angie. That was the first one. I hope we did that justice for you. We both really enjoyed that. It's a very fun chat. Uh, Gav still gobsmacked that they were eating dinosaur sandwiches. Not that bothered about it. Um, what was more shocking for you, Gav, before we finish? Was it the DJ in Caveman? <laughs> the oil the oil refinery that they set up within a few days? Or was it that they Asian just ate dinosaur. dinosaur and didn't give a shit? All of it. I'm totally <laughs> speechless by the whole thing. It's just so like I think the caveman DJ is just like, what is going on right now? Like, tell me I'm fucking tripping. Like, what the fuck? Brilliant. I've been asleep for ages for the flu, and I come out. Who's that guy? I was a caveman. We found what? Oh yeah, there's dancers up there. What? And what's the caveman doing? He's DJ. What? I talk to the DJ. Isn't that funny? What? Don't worry, we've got an oil refinery outside. We'll uh, get you to work in that. You know, the, the next thing you know, you turn around and the caveman's having a wank because he probably thinks that's the correct thing to do. We're building a McDonald's next week. <laughs> He's going to be in a drive through <laughs> <laughs> Hello, can I get a Big Mac? <sighs> Passing the debit machine to them. <laughs> <laughs> right, well... Look, Bill Murray's over there and he's waving at us frantically because he can't wait for some World of the Strange activity. So oh, I can't wait as well to see what you've brought me and the audience today. All right, well, uh, in that case, Bill, you've, you've come here as always. Do your thing. Introduce us to World of the Strange. Hi, welcome back to World of the Strange. Out of the strength. It's a strange world. This world is the strange one. So strong. Welcome. Welcome to World of the Strange. Thank you to Bill Murray as always. World of the Strange. <laughs> and to Michael Caine. Oh, World of the Strange. And to Nicholas Cage. Uh, I've got, for us this, this episode, Gab, I've got five. Five stories five okay. stories they're strange stories I like the strange stories now what I've done with them is I've put them in in, in order 
starting with the most tame, silliest of them, and working up to the most extreme for you to to sort of ease you in, as it were. Okay. Can you can you each time go like number three? It's, it's a, yeah. Uh, I know it's only five numbers for me to remember, but it is me. Of course. So let's start with number number one. Thank you. Number one, fire. This is about some firemen, some firefighters in the UK. They spent three hours removing, or should I say, removing a cow that has got stuck in a tree. How high up's a tree? <laughs> now. It wasn't up a tree. It was in, literally in a tree. Did it stick his head in it? It got its head and its shoulders stuck. It's probably going, oh, that's a good itch. Oh, that's <laughs> a good itch. Mavel, look. Oh, I found a good itch. Ah. Ah. Oh, no. <laughs> Ooh. So this is New Year. This is uh, in Hampshire. Uh, I am now in uh, the county of Hampshire in England. There we go. So, yeah, uh, in a place called Chilbolton Common. <laughs> this, Fuck those. Someone called out the firefighters at 7.40pm. Said that there's a cow stuck in a tree here. They probably thought, how did it get up the tree? Like like you did, but it was stuck literally in the trunk of the tree. <laughs> there's pictures of it. Bless it. For three hours to figure out how to free it. They cut parts of the tree away. Uh, the, the animal was very um, distressed, distressed, as Fuck you can yeah. imagine. <laughs> so they ended up having to move the cow a little bit, rubbing its head, oiling its head a bit, <laughs> cutting bits of the tree away. Poor thing. Um, and eventually, after three hours, the cow was released and is happy and alive and well <laughs> the cow it's a cow it's got a very very small brain but it just pops out all sorts of stuff whoa what the fuck and there's all these humans around like, with lots like, of sores and honestly shit. the hole the hole it's got its head in is so small I don't even know how it got it in there and I will post this up on the Facebook it's, page it's like a pervert cow oh like a glory tree hole so well, like, a bit like uh, Michael Hutch Michael Hutchins sort of choking himself a bit. Yeah. David Carradine. Kill Bill. <laughs> so that was number one. That was the tamest and silliest. Moving on to number two. You ready? Yep. Severed foot. These come up a lot. These feet, don't they? In these, uh, what are the strains? There's always a foot. Yeah, we've had, we've had, um... There's, there's one in Australia. Is, in the Thames, we've had stuff, it's been yardies or uh, voodoo things going on before. Well, this takes place in, yet this story, number two, is Yellowstone National Park. We've all heard of Yellowstone National Park, just in Wyoming, majority of it anyway. And a shoe was found floating in a hot spring. Is that where Yogi Bear's from? Uh, I'm not sure if he's from... He might be from Yellowstone. You might be right, yeah. Mm. And a shoe was found floating with a part, with a foot or part of a foot still in it. Hey, boo-boo. Hey, boo-boo. We're going to baskets. So, uh, <clears throat> what what shoe? A shoe with what part of a foot. What, what shoe? I don't know what type of shoe. Let's say it was a shell toe. Well, it's important to know. I don't know. It's going to give us more evidence. Of what's well, it, going on here. it might reveal this as I go through the story, I don't know. Right. But this, they had to close the spring temporarily because it was reported, oh, we found a foot. Um, it's part of it found drifting in, the yellow, in a hot spring of the Yellowstone National Park. Now, uh, there's many of these hot springs. Um, you know, some people get in them like a um, hot tub, but there's some of them that you cannot get in. As you can imagine, it's like molten lava, like magma. And it will melt the skin off you. And what they think is that this foot that they found is either related to somebody that was killed a couple of months before, and they've just found the foot. But what they think is most likely is somebody has fallen into one of the very, very hot springs, and it's melted away the majority of them, 
apart from just their foot in a shoe. Fuck. Yeah. <clears throat> what shoe? I don't know, I'm sorry. But what I can tell you is, every year, <clears throat> quite a few people die by falling into these these hot springs and getting burnt to death or melted. Jesus Christ, that's a bit much, isn't it? And I think, apparently, people will, like go and dive in them without checking what, whether it's the ones you can get in or the ones that will like melt rocks. Well, so they're just like, oh, look, let's jump in this one. This is, this is, honestly, this is why this planet is fucking doomed. Even with the best intentions by everybody and everyone trying to do what they can and protesting and everything else in the world, who fucking doomed it because there's so many thick twats in the world? There's so many thick fuckers. It was, it was, it, but that's exactly it. It's like, oh, Oscar, jump in. What, what are you doing? You know. Uh, we know it's a sneaker, if that helps, because it says the buoyancy of modern sneakers causes them to float and keep the foot in it, which is why it's usually the foot or, or feet that are found left at the end, because they're still in the trainer in the sneaker. They're bobbing um, around. Sarah shared a video on the High Strangers podcast my other podcast, my lovely Sarah, uh, uh, our Facebook page, a video of this crocodile, did you see it, carrying a dead body, just yes. swimming along, and it's just like, what the shit, and it does, it's just doing its thing, it's just taking its body along, and it's just like, the creepiest things, this body like, the face down, just like, being pulled under the water along, it was fucking Yeah, because what they'll disturbing. do is, they'll, they'll, if you're not already dead, they'll take you down to the bottom of the body of water that you're in, and they'll spin you round a few times, hoping to knock you into any obstacles that are down there. And then they'll find a rock, a log or a rock, and they'll jam you. You drown before then. Well, they jam you under the log or the rock under the water and leave you for like half a day. And then they come out and they're like, he's definitely dead now, so now I'm going to eat him. But then they, that's like their, their storage for food. They go back there. They keep feeding it's, on you then. It was just disturbing to watch the video, but I thought when you said that as foot at first thought, I thought, is it going to be like something like that, you know? No. <clears throat> okay, well, that's number two, thank you. That's... No problem. So, number three. Yeah. So, we're going to step it up a notch now. <clears throat> this, this next story contains two famous people, and I'm going to read you the headline, and we're going to go through the story together, okay? Charlie Sheen, Steven Seagal, <laughs> John Lennon. Uh -huh. had a UFO encounter so scary that he rang me at 3am in the morning says Yuri Geller <laughs> 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 what is it John? Let, let that sink in oh, I've just seen a, an alien in the garden <laughs> okay. thought you would be the person to tell is that, you know, I was going to write a song about it. Well, have you decided to bend any spoons? Because <laughs> me and Michael Jackson are bending spoons. He was mates with Michael Jackson, wasn't he, Yuri they, was, they were spoon benders together. He was the best man at his wedding. Yeah. yeah. How yeah did I they, think, what think he's they, godfather as well. What do they do? Chat about it. Uh, what do you talk about? You're Michael Jackson. Like, I've got like, a, a new son. I'm like, like, in the... In, different realms to the normal person no one to ever be like like what I am and I'm going to chat to you he's a and you're a, uh, well, no, it's, again not proven you can't <laughs> it, is, it isn't proven like you know um, and, and you're talking to a dude it's like, like really I can't do magic I can kind of bend spoons a bit that's my thing that's my forte so I just rub I a spoon and it bends and that's what and I'm then, known for like <laughs> and then Macaulay Culkin's hanging out with them as a child, and it's then it's going to be some weird parties. You're going to need cocaine though for some of those parties, just to get you through them. And then Michael Jackson's best friend is a chimp called Bubbles. Throw that in the mix. How do you then go down to the local supermarket and just go shopping? I mean, you've just been in a room with people like that. It's just, you know what I mean, it's just insanity. So that was the headline. Let's get into the story. So the Beatles legend woke me up in the middle of the night and told me, "Come over quickly." after having a close encounter, so that, that's that's getting into the story. So here we go. So, John Lennon was left trembling after meeting an alien-like figure, according to his close friend and serial spoonbender, Yuri Geller. The Beatles icon had no doubt that an extraterrestrial had visited him. It was so traumatic, he rang Yuri at 3am for comfort. And 
when Yuri went over in the pair met up, Yuri was shocked by John's appearance. Yuri said, John woke me up in the middle of the night and he says, Yuri, you've got to come quickly. Something unbelievable has just happened to me. Now, I'm just going to pause that story there because John Lennon and the Beatles famously loved drugs. Acid mainly. Fucking loved it. Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. LSD, people. <clears throat> in John Lennon's defence, yes, that's the first thing you could jump to. And I'm quite possibly I'm tipping my hat towards that's going to be on the scale of 50 50. It's more towards that. Um, but at the same time, after the, what, the, the huge UFO episode I did recently, huge is in research and, and time span and really getting into it. Yeah, yeah, I've got a like, so, well, what's his, does he have any more information on his uh, uh, experience? <laughs> well, apparently he said to John, look, it's three in the morning. Uh, if you really want me to come over, I will. And he said, I do. I need you here. <clears throat> so, you know, you wake up, you see an alien. The first thing you're going to do is get Yuri Geller around. Definitely. <laughs> Who should I ring? All my spoons are straight. Come round, get them all bent over. Um, so he said, I could feel something was going on and something was desperately wrong with John. So, of course, I went there immediately. Um, I told him, look, I can't get to you, but why don't we meet halfway? I'll meet you at a hotel. He's a bit of a hanger on her, isn't he? Always thought that about him. So they meet at a hotel at like four in the morning. So what's this hotel feeling, thinking? They've got someone half asleep behind the desk. <laughs> yes, yes. John Lennon. He's and half Yuri asleep, Keller. just don't fall in a sleepy He's hand the whole time. Oh, I can't, my shift finishes at 6 a.m. I can't wait. <laughs> just to... over in the corner, <laughs> the, the the excitement, and you can tell the energy buzzing of John Lennon just really hyper in his chair, moving back and forth with his body language in the distance. And occasionally you just hear the odd word in the wind come over to you. Alien! And then Yuri oh goes, goes, I'm here to meet my friend. Um, <laughs> uh, well, there's only John Lennon sitting over there, really that's him, hyper. That's the guy. I made him sound like Christoph Waltz. That's <laughs> my impression of him. I sound like Christoph Waltz. As Yuri Geller walks over to the table, the, the guy behind the desk just shouts to the kitchen supervisor, the only person working in the kitchen now, get that fucking cutlery off the table. <laughs> Yuri's on his way over. Geller's here again. Get it off. So they met in the hotel lobby. He said, I remember he was standing in the corner. He was shaking and he was pale. Yuri said, I quizzed him about the incident. I tried to calm him down. I said, John, what's happened? And he said to me, I was lying in my bed and suddenly I saw a light by my bedside. I mean, it could have been his lamp, Gav. It could have been. He said, "This out of this light, a hand stretched out an extraterrestrial hand. Oh, here we go. My first question was, what did you smoke? I asked him, what have you been smoking? And he said, I've not been smoking anything. This PCP. actually happened to me. Crack. John was already fascinated by it. He believed it existed. And actually, in 1974, he claimed he saw a UFO when he was in New York in his flat. And John and Yuri had actually become very good friends over their interest and belief in ETs and UFOs. So where was he when when, he saw this particular incident? Uh, He was at his home in London. Okay, what, was he just fucking looking out the window? He He was in bed. No, he's in bed and a light appeared next to his bed and a hand stretched out. It's more of an apparition, like a, a spirit order for more. Well, Yuri said, look, we really connected because I believe extraterrestrials. I believe in aliens. There's no doubt that UFOs exist. There will be a UFO encounter that we will see in the media sooner or later. And that's kind of all he says, really, because obviously you've got to buy his books and no more. But... um and John was shot dead in 1986. Of course you do. Of course you got a boy's book to know more. It's called You Be the Big Spoon, I'll Be the Little Spoon. That's it. That's Let's bend that spoons up. together. Yeah. A, a day in the life of Yuri. A fork in the road. <laughs> it's a spent spoon in my hand. <laughs> Why don't you tell me what all the other uh, Jewish people are in your basement and... Uh, 
Christoph Waltz there. Yeah. Glorious bastards. Um, so... Uh, Yuri Geller played that role in Tarantino's... Imagine if Christoph Waltz played Yuri Geller. <laughs> I just want to ask John Lennon what he saw in his bedroom that no, time. I'm, I'm going to see someone like Michael Fassbender to take it really seriously. Oh, my God. <laughs> Uh, so right. that was that was number three. Now number four, we are stepping it up a fucking notch here. Hold on to your hats for this one. Man wakes up for a wee wee in the middle of the night. I do this multiple times. Finds out he's actually in a coffin in the middle of being sacrificed. Gav's eyebrows, everyone, just went up re- about a foot in the air. Well, I was just picturing it all. First of all. I'm probably going to start pissing myself. Can he see? Can he Can't get out of the coffin. Tell us more. What's going oh, on? He, he does get out. So Victor Hugo is the the guy's name. Sounds like a made up character's name. Here we go. A terrified festival goer says he was being offered as a human sacrifice to Mother Earth when he woke up trapped in a coffin after a drinking binge. Okay, this was in Bolivia, a music festival in Bolivia. Okay. So the terrified gentleman, 30 years old, had to smash out of the the casket, which was about 50 miles away from where he passed out, in the city of El Alto in Bolivia. <laughs> He'd been drinking very heavily the night before at the opening of the Mother Earth Festival, where the indigenous people offer everything from live animals and sheep fetuses to sweets, cocoa leaves and more to the goddess who they believe opens her mouth for offerings in August. Victor claims he was among one of the human sacrifices that some people in the media and the rumours speculate are still happening in ancient style rituals in this part of Bolivia to satisfy Mother Earth. He he told told the local media he, he was covered in mud and concrete and there's a picture of him covered in blood, mud... He said uh, he was covered in mud and concrete after his apparent escape. He said, last night was the pre-entry of the festival. We went dancing. I got drunk. I don't really remember much after that. The only thing I remember was I thought I woke up and I was in my bed. I needed to pee. I couldn't move because I was stuck. I realized I was in a coffin. I pushed the coffin. I managed to break the glass. So it was a glass-fronted coffin. And I smashed out. Uh, the glass broke. I climbed through the the glass, out of the dirt, out of the hole, and they wanted to use me as a sacrifice. What the shit? What, what happened when he got to the surface? First of all, did they all go, Jesus Christ, there's like a zombie coming up? Like... All, the, all the mud started pouring in the hole as he was trying to climb out. Hmm. Uh, he managed to break through, though, and he obviously cut himself quite badly. That's why he's got blood all over his head. He's cut his head open. <laughs> Getting out of the glass, yeah. Yeah, um, he said to the police, they, because the police didn't believe him, he said, look, I've been buried alive, they've been trying to sacrifice me. When he came out of the ground, though, everyone had gone. But I don't think there was anyone around. Right. Uh, they left him for dead. I mean, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty good story if you want to get away with being a bit smashed the night before, isn't it? And just saying to your mates, they were like, what happened to you? It's I'm, a bit look, much. You won't know. Honestly, I got, they almost sacrificed me. That's a bit full on. I think he was a bit drunk, guys. Um, but his whole hand has been cut open. He barely got out alive. He went to the place. They said, look, you're drunk. They said, you've got, you've got to go home, so rub and come back and tell us a story. So he did, and he told them the story again. Now, the term Sulu, which is the sacrifice, refers to any offering commonly made to give back to Mother Earth or the Pachmama throughout the month of August in Bolivia. And while they often take the form of sweets or llamas, so they sacrifice llamas, uh, plants, eggs, minerals, sometimes humans are rumoured to still be sacrificed to this day. Well, okay. So this guy, the police don't really believe him, but... It's right out of a horror movie, isn't it? I do go on holiday and get wasted. What's that Bill Pullman movie? Uh, Rainbow, Serpent Serpent of the Rainbow, Rainbow. yeah, Yeah, fucking hell. Yeah. <clears throat> no, it's not what you want, is it? No. Hmm. So, I was only going to do four stories, but then my wife sent me 
story number five. Okay. Now, as someone who likes a YouTube rabbit hole, Gav, and I know you do, mm-hmm. you might already know about this one. But there is a documentary on YouTube about an, a family of inbred people called the Whitakers. Have you heard of this? No. Okay. I don't really like inbreds. No offence to them if they're oh, listening. Fucking hell. Sorry to all our inbred listeners. I don't really know where to go with that one. I don't know either. <laughs> I do apologise. You know, I'm just not into you guys. It's not into you. They're into each other, so they keep it in the family, and that's fine. And that is exactly what happens here, because let's talk about the Whitaker family. They live in a place called Odd. O double D. <laughs> oh my god. But you, mm. like, really, you could just, like, what's the perfect word for where someone lives? Odd. Odd in Virginia they live in. Uh, right, the inbred it, it, family from Odd. They live in the Appalachian Mountains, which is where all the, the inbreds are rumoured to sort of There's fuck a each other. Of inbreds in a mountain in a place called Odd. That is just a David Lynch children's, his idea of a children's fantasy film. Well, let's get into this, because it's a very interesting story. And, <clears throat> guys, it's something you want to check out on YouTube if, if you've got some several hours so there's a filmmaker called mark later and he's created a documentary exploring uh, this family they're apparently america's most famous inbred family and also america's most inbred family most straight away why is that category most inbred family as well as in, they're the most inbred family why is there categories and degrees of these categories um, right, so um, how so does most... who, who decides how, what how inbred that family is to the next one? Is there a, like a table of three of them sit there and say, right, next one's up to the uh, uh, bumpkin they, family? Hang on, they've only got one finger on each hand. That one's got five. They're not no. that inbred. Give them four out of ten. No, put them on the scale at four. Now, now we got this family. Look at that fucker. Seven out of ten for this family. So, interesting story there. So, um, he's a photographer, and he came across this family by accident. So, uh, they made it to the spotlight after Mark took some pictures of them for his book in 2004. So, he had a book called Created Equal, which was just him taking pictures of local people. He he ended up in the Appalachian Mountains, and he came across this fucking cabin, which is something straight out of a horror film, and he took some pictures. Um, And he's gone back now and again, um, he went back in 2020 and started filming them as well. Um, and the video's gone viral. It's on YouTube. And the video is called Inbred Family, The Whitakers. And it's got 29 million views on YouTube. Okay. Um, the video shows the family with members of older generations all living in a small uh, hut in the small town in the Appalachian region. And as I've said, this place is called Odd. Uh, the video highlights how the Whitakers struggle to make ends meet. They all live in a house with several dogs, five or six dogs as well. That fuck each other, I'm sure. And they are British by descent, apparently. He's he's looked into their past a bit. And there's some coal mining in the family. From what you can work out, there's a family which is Ray, Lorraine, Timmy, Freddie, and a sister, possibly, that doesn't have a name. She just lives in the house with them, some woman. Uh, there's somebody, the Freddy guy died of a heart attack several years ago, but they talk about him quite a lot still. And it believes there's, he said there's other individuals who are part of the family who I don't know their names, and some of them I've only seen once or twice. They sort of pop up out the woodwork or in the woods. Well, who's that over there? It's Jonathan. People under the stairs. Yeah. Uh, so, so why do you... Yeah, go on. I don't know how many of them there are, essentially. Um, <coughs> I've watched I've watched one or two of the videos. It's terrifying. So they're considered to yeah, be the most... Really watch it. The most inbred family in the US. Uh, Congratulations. Their parents are... They were thought to be that their parents were brother and sister, but it turns out they weren't. Their parents were cousins, but they're all related. So basically, they've all been in the cousins' bloodline. 
and obviously though over the years it's most likely that brothers and sisters have fucked and created babies as well oh it makes me feel sick um they all have every member has mental and physical abnormalities why do they keep doing it they don't know any better they live in the, the woods They've got no TV. They live in a shack full of holes it's gonna be with like, about six dogs. No medical care, really. Like, it's gonna be nothing like that. It's just literally them. Two or three of the family cannot even speak English. They communicate through grunts and squawks. One of them barks like a dog. In Isn't the video. that sad, though? Yeah, yeah. <sighs> there's, there's never been a medical examination on them. Yeah, of course. Um, and. Their health issues are all from inbre inbreeding, of course. Of course. Um, now, one of the times that this photographer went there, he got shot at by the neighbours because apparently neighbouring farmers who live near to them are very protective of this family because they feel sorry for them and they know that they're not, they're not right and they've got no money. So they shot at him and said, you're trying to exploit them, you know, or... or oh, okay, you, yeah, fair enough. And, and he's like, no, I'm really not. I, I actually I know one or two of them. I've been coming here for about 20 years on and off, taking pictures and videoing them. And he, he proved it, and they so they didn't kill him. But like that's that's pretty fucking scary as well. But basically, all the neighbours in the area... Different world, isn't it? Yeah, it really is, it really is. He set up a GoFundMe for this family to help them create make their home nice. Was it was there a stipulation in it, though? Like, you've you got to stop having sex with each other. I don't know. It's but... just, it's not a hard thing to do. So far, they've raised $46,000 to help their, their house. Oh. Oh, poor you guys for fucking each other. They've like... all got. They've all got cross eyes or one eye going up and one eye going down. Imagine them all like, having a conversation with each other. Nobody knows who's looking at who. So they. The video I've seen to describe it, he gets there and there's three or four of them sat there. Now, I don't know if they are 80 years old or 18 years old. They look like they could be either age. <laughs> they all look a bit like, you know, on um, Freaks, those pinhead girls. I've not seen it. They all look a bit like that, but with cross eyes or weird eyes, going, one going down. And he goes inside at one point. He sneaks inside because he sees some dogs in there. And one of the guys in there just starts going rawr, 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 to him, like barking at him. And he says, what are you having for dinner? And the guy just goes, arr, arr, starts growling at him. I don't want to say this. It's to, it, it makes me just like, Ugh. no offense, no offense. Guys, wanna, you know, you've you've got to watch at least one or two of these videos on YouTube. The Whitaker family. I can't, no, but I couldn't do that. It is. I've, uh, uh, yeah, I feel sorry for them in a way, but at the same time, yeah, like I feel sorry for the kids that have just been brought into this in this this crazy world. But the, the, the instigators from the get go, the first to get started somewhere, don't do it. So they, they, they defend their lifestyle and say that all their deformities, especially their bad eyes, come from years and years of coal mining. But they haven't coal mined for years. They're all farmers. Oh, yeah, it's the same. Everybody always says, everyone thinks they're all right. All right. <laughs> and you're wrong. I am right. You know. Whatever. I believe there's a girl there that doesn't even have a name. I don't know. I, it's a weird one. Makes you think of that X Files episode. Yeah. Oh, keeping her under the bed in a drawer. Oh, pull out, mum. <laughs> pull, pull out, mum. Back. Bitch, Tidy your room. Back you go. So there we go, guys. We've covered um, a cow. We've covered a foot in a hot spring where the other rest of the person melted away. This is giving code for something. Keep going. Cow foot. Yuri Geller and Yuri John Geller, Lennon. But Yuri Geller, no, that's enough. Coffin, uh, well, sacrifice. <laughs> oh my god, that's amazing. And finally, inbred. Wow, cow. So, foot. Ga Ga Yuri. you won't, you won't know this very well, but on, um, sacrifice on the, on the Captain America movies, the Winter Soldier. I, I have he, seen it, but I don't remember it. So he's a sleeper agent, and they wake him up by saying. A series of random words and it sort of sparks his 
double agentness in his head. So if his secret words were this, it would be, are you ready for this? Cow. Foot. Yuri Geller. <laughs> uh, sacrifice. And inbred. And then he'd be like, right, I'm ready to fight Captain America. And that would be... So there we go. That's his sleeper agent. Uh, Mine's hot dog. Hot dog. Right, you always bring up hot dog in. I don't. It's... This is the third episode in a row. Hot, hot dog. dog. At the food. A hot don't dog. Don't say it like hot dog jumping frog. Are you trying to say like I'm trying to, you know? Well, I know what you're uh, trying. No, to... I'm not trying to say anything weird. It's not weird. I don't even know hot dogs that much. I just thought it'd be funny to say hot dogs. I don't mind a hot dog. I like your, a... I like your stories today, listeners. Did you enjoy the little stories from Daniel? Bill Murray is quite shocked at that last one. Look at his face. You love it, Bill. You love going to visiting odd. Jesus. Um, right. Which out of all of those, before we go out of all of those, which would you say is the most believable, and which would you say is most just believable? Oh, yeah. the, the, the the last one was the most just like what the fuck? Uh, most believable. Uh, the foot. <clears throat> Awful. Mm. I think the weirdest and most unbelievable is Yuri Geller just trying to suck fame out of a dead beetle so badly. And he just needs to stop it now. I'm surprised he hasn't got to come up with loads of stories about Michael Jackson. When time Michael and I were in his garden. He when probably has, but you've got to buy his book to know. Buy the book to learn the rest of this story. Yeah there we go well there we go guys Bill thank you so much for you know being on intro and outro duty um, if there's nothing else from you Gav I think we should let Bill take us out of here and we'll come back and we'll go deep 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 to Atlantis indeed let's go that's all the time we've got for this week on World of Strange next week though give me Ira hairless pets weird Back in the dawn of time, a strange traveler came from outer space and plunged beneath the sea. Through the centuries, countless ships have disappeared without trace in the Bermuda Triangle. Yet there are men who still dare to probe the mysteries of these dangerous waters. The discovery of a fantastic hidden metropolis under the ocean leads to spectacular action and thrilling adventure in Warlords of Atlantis. Where are you taking us? To safety. Starring Doug McClure, Peter Gilmore, with guest stars Sid Charisse and Daniel Massey. We'll not find it on any map, but you know its name. Atlantis. They defy an underwater world of tyranny and terror. From our dying planet, we journeyed across space. We brought our cities, our power and ambition. We are a master race. Can you help us get out of here? We are damned, mister. There's no escape. Let your mind join with us in the greatness of our quest. Serving the power of Atlantis. The power of Atlantis. Atlantis. Doug McClure and Peter Gilmore join forces to survive a living hell below. Monster terror above. Okay, so our final review, as picked again by our patron RJ, is Warlords of Atlantis or Warlords of the Deep. It's got two titles from 1978, the year I was born. Mm, sexy. Actually, One of them could be a sexy title, couldn't it? Warlords of the Deep. 
it came out about a month after I was born, actually. So I was about a month old when this was released in theatres. So here's the synopsis. You didn't, you didn't watch it when it came out, then? I, I didn't, know. So here's the synopsis. Two deep-sea explorers and their crew survive, must survive a master race of beings and monstrous creatures when they accidentally discover the fabled city of Atlantis. Starring Doug McClure. Starring again. Doug McClure, again, not being so shocked by all of this. No. Not at all. No, they're just literally just like, totally chilled. We've seen dinosaurs, yeah, it's definitely could be a city. To be fair, they go down, and we'll get into this properly in a minute, they go down in basically a, an upside down cup. <laughs> Just a giant bucket control by down. Con- controlled by pressure. How does that work? I was watching, thinking, how is he driving this bucket, this giant bucket, upside down? I don't there know. must be pressure pushing that so it doesn't come in. It has to be, because and they must have a, a system for, to be able to breathe as well, because they can't be breathing what air's in there. As soon as they do that, uh, the water will probably come in as well. So I, I, just, I, don't, I have no idea. I don't know what's it's quite, going on. It's quite vulnerable as well, because you've got the hole in the bottom. <laughs> we get to it. We get to it. Shush, we get to it. <laughs> okay, okay. So we start off with a comet. I love that bit. A comet heading towards Earth. Correct, and land, credits. And it lands in the sea. But these credits are over this bit. Right, straight away, Warlords of Atlantis, Dan, let's make a band. Oh, wow, yes. Just standing there on a mountain. We're Warlords of Atlantis. And number one this week is again Warlords of Atlantis. Yeah. With their, <laughs> with their, so, their famous song. Yeah. Whatever it's called. Bucket in the Water, or whatever it's called. Deep Loving. Um, <laughs> so yeah, comet. We start with a comet. Now I didn't see the alien. Uh, I never saw it coming because I I don't know if I'd ever seen this one. No, I've never um, seen this. But we'll get to the aliens because there are aliens in this. This dynamic credit sequence is so good to, to give us just uh, and, uh, coming in and tell us who's in it and stuff, what's going on, and just these really bright red lights and just like, <laughs> so what the fuck. It's like quite a good opening, I thought. It is, it is. And, and we sort of we go through the water and into the sea. We see what looks like an underwater city. Uh, the credits are flying by. The music's playing. And we know we're in for a bit of an epic time, especially because we know Doug's in this. And we know that Doug likes to have a good scrap with some big monsters. I love the fact that Doug's done these movies. I did watch the other one on the box set, though. Uh, What's the other one on there? Uh, I can't remember now. Um... Hang on. We're, we're staying on air. I'll go get it. Just chat to yeah. the audience. I will do. Um, famously, uh, Doug McClure, for anyone that doesn't know, was also in a, a film called Humanoids of the Deep, um, which was about some fish people who uh, basically just rape women. Uh, I didn't really like that film very much. Hello. Sorry. Humanoids of the Deep, Gab, oh. as far as I got. Have you seen that? Uh, yeah, I watched it again recently, actually. Um uh, with Sarah because she'd never seen it. It's it's a, it's a weird one. Monster rape. Yeah, fish, monster fish, fish rape. Fishman rape. Yeah. Um, that's the box set there. So oh, there sorry. Go. Rang the not fingers. You want to say Doug McClaw's fantasy adventure triple bill: the land that time forgot, uh, warlords of Atlantis, and what's the last one? Uh, oh, at the Earth's core. Yeah. And there's dinosaurs on that one as well. But that's it. I didn't see that one, but I think I might have seen that one as a kid. Yeah, I've seen that one for sure. Um, that's where they discover that there's like a, a middle earth, like in the middle of I, the earth. I, I, do you know what, though? I bet they're not fucking surprised. <laughs> they're not. Just, oh. it, it's just like, they're like the Carry On Gang or something. We and, found a, a whole just, bunch of aliens surprised. in the middle of the earth. Imagine the Carry Ons. Doing the spoof of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, did they not do a carry on like a pretty story thing? Did they, did they carry on caveman or something? It feels like it's something they should have done if they didn't. Yeah. Bit that would like have, have been just really, really misogynist and sexist. 
it would have been quite racist, I should it imagine. Been, it might not have been very good. No. <laughs> so that's our beginning. Comet, water, epic. And we cut to an American ship with a diving bell on it. And Doug McClaw is there. He's playing baseball. The Texas Rose. That's what it's called. And he's throwing his baseball around because he's a true American. Um, it's, it's, it's very good music score just before that. We had these like a real like, futuristic Egyptian looking buildings. Yeah, uh, underwater. Uh, really weird. It's very Egyptian. Uh, uh, this is based on. Um, which is quite an interesting concept, actually. And, um, uh, yeah, the music is very intriguing of what's going on. But, yes, yeah, so we're straight to this uh, ship with uh, Doug McClure just saying, Hey, guys, I'm throwing a ball. Hey, I'm, I'm your funny uncle type character. I'm a real American man, and I play baseball. Yeah, how old is he sort of playing in this? He's mid-50s? Uh, Early 50s? Maybe 40s, even. Maybe our age. You know, do you reckon? Yeah. So, luckily, so there's lots of scientists on this ship, on the Texas Rose, and but they're, there's also lots of crew that don't understand oh, they, they think They think they're a fucking bunch of fucking silver-spooned uh, uh, rich boys. And they've just got more it. money than a, a sense, because these are, these are a working, working fella. Yeah, and they, don't, they say to them, you know, how is this going to work, then, this diving bell? How is it going to work? So, luckily for us as an audience... Doug McClaw will explain now well, should we explain how the diving bell works. Why they're there, what's going on. The, this professor and his son uh, have asked Doug to uh, help lead them uh, with a, a crew uh, and a captain of a ship to um, uh, an area for um, trying to find... Not really a lost city, are they? They're trying to, are they trying to find the object they, they find? They're trying to find something. They think there's something down there. And it's, this is... They tell the crew one thing, and this is one thing that pisses the crew off later on when there's a bit of a mutiny. Professor Atkin and his son, Charles Atkin, they're the two main guys. And then they've got Doug McClaw, who's an engineering genius. Is he Kurt Russell? Because they is. remade it. He is. He's Kurt Russell slash Bruce Campbell. Yeah. Uh, and he explains, using a coffee cup, he explains how one would get into the diving bell and go underwater and the water wouldn't would only go in a little bit and using air pressure and a big pipe that's sort of pumping water into this diving bell they would you know they wouldn't die they wouldn't drain they'd be able to control and they'd be able to go deeper than they've ever been before yeah I, I, i'm pretty sure if it's submerged into like a real low depth i don't think the pressure like that's gonna work I don't think. But then again, I could be wrong. There's an element of almost the Bermuda Triangle because part of the reason they're there, to go back to what you were asking just now, is they're in an area they're in an area of the sea where there's been lots of missing ships over the years. Um, and they want to go down and they want to see what, what the hell. They, they talk about mysteries of the sea and mysteries of the deep. But really, the professors have got an ulterior to, uh, motive going on here. They've got some uh, other plan. And uh, Cliff from Cheers is one of the crewmen, isn't he? Oh, really? John Ratzenberger. Oh, my gosh. Let me have a... Yeah. Uh, let me, I'll do some looking. He's on the crew. Uh, so the professor... Professor Atkins, he gets in the diving bell with Doug, and he says, "Well, let's go. Let's get down. That's, that's what we're here for." Oh, okay. You know John Ratzenberger? Well, I don't know now. Yeah. yeah. So we've had someone from the bill and someone from Cheers in this one. <laughs> uh, so they go, they go in the water, and they're not down there more than a few minutes when this crazy snake-headed creature comes in the uh, in the diving bell, and it's like a dinosaur. Yeah, uh, it, it takes no time at all, really. No, no, they're not surprised, obviously. They don't no, get even surprised in this. It bites Doug McClaw's arm. He's not that surprised. And then, hilariously, and RJ mentioned this in his email, it bites and eats the pencil <laughs> of the professor. And he just, all he says is, he doesn't say, fucking hell, that was a dinosaur. He says, oh, it's eating my pencil. Yeah, they're just in their little submarine. They've gone, they've gone down to this place, and they're completely vulnerable, like you say, of this hole just there. 
and they're just sitting there and all of a sudden I'm again watching this movie just like this movie quite interesting this submarine while they're doing down there looking all of a sudden this dinosaur's head's there it's mm-hmm. just so like what the fuck but I'm I'm quite sur- I'm quite surprised by this and I'm not even in the submarine with them they must be a little surprised like having this su- thing right there it's quite funny well, the professor says that seems to be an extinct dinosaur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's quite surprising. But it, it latches on and it won't let go. It, it keeps attacking them. So what they do is they they run an electrical current into the diving bell, and because they're safe inside it apparently, but the outside of it electrifies, therefore electrocuting the dinosaur. I like the wide shot. So the the creature looks quite effective. It's very good. Uh, it's it's really well feature. done because obviously. What you're doing is obviously having a little, like, model made of whatever clay, whatever thing you've made it with. And um, uh, uh, then obviously getting it to fit the size, so then when you get to cut to these close-ups and things, and it's just done really quite well, actually. Well, after they electrocute the dinosaur, (laughs) just, you know, just casually, uh, they spot some kind of a statue... Um, or uh, some kind of object, treasure. It looks like a top of a statue. So they they hover over it. So the hole at the bottom of their diving bell goes over the top of the statue, and they bring it in, and they they cut it off, and they bring it on board, um, and they go back up. I don't like the intrusive hole. You don't like it. No. You feel exposed. You feel just all of a sudden they have this big gold thing just going into it. It's a bit like oh, it feels a bit too sexual. It's an intrusive hole. Big gold dildo. Oh, just to know. It's just like it is penetrating in a way, though. Well, they bring it on board and uh, they go back up and they bring it on board and there's just going. Is this gold? What is this? You know. And the crew. The captain's not not happy about having it on board. Is he superstitious? He says this isn't what we were told this is going to happen. We yeah, weren't told so, that you were looking for artifacts. So the crew are just like, well, great, let's fucking do them all in, basically, because you know that the crew's going to think it straight away. Like, look how much fucking that's going to be worth. Because if it's gold, and it's going to be worth thousands and thousands of. Well, well, I don't know what it would be, tens of thousands, maybe. Well, while they're arguing over it, you know, while the. The, the scientists are fascinated with what this could mean because this is we don't know what it what they know they they suspect it to be something but we don't know that yet all we know is they they're excited that they found this thing but the crew are excited that this could potentially be gold and could be like they they can retire now so they plan to steal it but while that this is all happening a giant fucking octopus well, decides <clears throat> What you got is that essentially there's only really three crew members. It's not a huge ship. So I guess they're working with that and much. A captain, three crew, and Doug McClure, I suppose. I suppose if you've got Doug McClure, it's kind of like having your Jackie Chan or your Stephen Seagal, isn't it, I guess? You just compare you? Doug McClure to Jackie Chan. And Stephen Seagal. Um, um, <laughs> I just mean that they're going to have like other things that they can do. I don't know. MacGyver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Versatile. Ad- adapt. Um, what am I saying? Giant octopus. Yes, but, so, so there's only three of them, but they, they've got basically this phone line which goes down to the sub down at the bottom, which Doug and the, 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 the professor's son's in. So they're ringing up, just trying to get a hold of them. And the, the, one of the guys who ends up being the sort of the lead of the baddies of the the, the seaman, uh, he's a bad seaman. He's a bit of a, a bit of a naughty <laughs> seaman, naughty bad seaman, in fact, really. Um, he decides to just go and put a mop head on top of the phone, so they can't hear the buzzing of it ringing. So downstairs, so they're just like, oh fuck them, like that. Then downstairs in the sub, they spot a fucking octopus, and they're like, oh my god, we've got to let them know. So they're ringing them up again, going, oh, why aren't you answering the phone up there? <laughs> to, so they're up there going, oh, whatever. And it's like, if you didn't just answer it, you know, there's a what? There's a fucking big octopus, right? Admittedly, they can't do much about it. The octopus is coming, a phone call's not going to help, but I guess it prepares them slightly for five, five seconds. Yes, if there's a giant octopus coming to attack me, I'd rather know about it. I'd rather you phone me. Just to say what that is, yeah. You know, because it, it, it takes... It basically attacks the shit. It's, it's like, just, basically, just, guarding just, this yeah? this 
this object that's essentially yeah it's attracted to it and it's guarding it you should just turn this into some sort of HP Lovecraft thing it starts taking the ship apart it starts attacking people it's really good effects for the tentacles it looks cool the octopus I like the octopus's uh, manoeuvres and how it does move through the war yeah, later, it's great. later on when it appears like later on in the movie you know, as it comes up to the water again I love the way it just slowly goes along kind of reminds me of like Michael Myers or something <laughs> You're comparing along. this octopus to Michael Myers. Yeah, yeah, my notes later on does actually say about Michael Myers at some point. Now, while this is all happening, they, the crew, who've already decided that they're going to have a mutiny and they're going to steal this piece of what they consider gold, yeah. they cut the tether to the diving bell, letting them fall further and further down. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, but we've basically got this moment where this, this bad... But it's bad naughty semen it has just put the mop head on top of the phone that's bad enough as it is because like we need to be able to communicate to these guys this is like a very old fashioned way of doing things it's like just normal rope for a whole submarine going down like you'd need chains really that's just ridiculous to have rope um so, but yeah, the one that says, oh, fuck this shit, and just basically chops the rope, essentially killing two people. Yeah, and then he shoots the remaining professor, Professor Atkin. Yeah. And thinks, well, that's that, we've killed him, great, we're going to have this gold. Uh, we'll just say that they drowned, whatever we'll say, we'll did, say did something. Did the captain shoot the... He shoots the professor. professor. Yep. He, he admits it later on when he says, to him, oh, I've turned to the dark side as well. Not, I don't know why he's not Sean Connery, and he's not Darth Vader either. Um, so, Imagine Sean Connery was Darth Vader. I'm your father, Luke. I'm your father, Luke. And and who's going to play Luke in this scenario? Daniel Craig. <laughs> Random. And the Emperor is Roger Moore. No, oh, Roger Moore. Um, so the octopus. Basically, smashes down the mast thing of the crew, all the masts. It takes the crew, it drowns them all. Um, and Doug and Charlie can only watch this. Doug and Charlie are in the, uh, in the, in the bell, and they can only watch this happen. So they, what are we going to do? We, well, the octopus has gone into the cave. Oh, yeah, right, great. Well, why don't we... Oh, we're sucked into the cave as well. And they go into the cave with the octopus and they're sucked in. It's super dark though, just before they get sucked in and they're looking out the porthole and they see the octopus go by and the octopus has got you know, all his tentacles. All the all the sailors, everybody there on the boat. Is, I know. And it's, that is dark as shit. He's, he's got, so in each of his eight arms, he's got a crewman. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and it's just like, that is dark. It's quite, it's a, really wide, it's good. quite a real long wide shot so you can see, really see the whole thing. And you'd think it wouldn't look that good for a film in 1978, but it looks really good. So that is a really dark idea. Later on, we discover that they're not actually dead. But... Imagine little RJ, sort of eight years old, whatever he was, seeing that happen, that scene there. Yeah. There's a reason he's scared to go back in the water after watching the films like this and Jaws and stuff. So, yeah, so th- these films always have a giant cave in them, and they go into a giant cave... And it gets sucked in through the current, and it pops up in a strange land. At this point, though, we've got the, the, the two guys, Doug Doug and the uh, prof son. Charlie. Doug and Charlie. Sounds like a Nickelodeon program. <laughs> <clears throat> Doug and Charlie uh, uh, still think that the octopus was the reason that the, their line was cut and they were yeah. taken down. They don't think that the, the, the seamen were naughty seamen. They, they don't they were think good seamen. They don't know about the mutiny that's happened. And they'll find that out much later on. Which is a nice little thing touched later on, actually. It's very good. It's very mm. good. So when you think um, the film's ended, and there's like, oh, I hope there's uh, some comeuppance. So they, they pop out in this strange land and they hear some strange sounds they don't know what it is it's probably dinosaurs they're not shocked yeah they yeah totally they come out and they they come out of their sub don't they they and they go oh where are we and they swim over and they meet up with the other three and they find they're all alive the crewmen the three crewmen are alive oh yeah that's it on the beach the three of them are aren't they and say this and uh one of them says what is this place there's no land near here for 200 miles just on the other side, though, we've got a young lad who was like the professor's uh, uh, assistant is back like in the cabin boat, boy. and he's uh, trying to nurse the professor who has been shot by the bad guys, or, or shot by the, sh- uh, the captain. 
In a, in a remake, that young cabin boy would be played by Mackenzie Crook, Gareth from The Office, who is also in in uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. That's that's who. Well, that's weird casting. You're not casting my next movie. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, the crew are alive and they start waking up, and this is where they meet a gentleman called Atmir. He's got a fantastic haircut. That haircut. When you join them... Talk to me, talk to me, Gav. When you join them, do you have to have this haircut? <laughs> Describe it, it. It's, uh... <laughs> centre part, uh, it's like centre part and long, like, curtained hair down to the, your, like, chin on either side. But then as it comes up and goes into the fringe area, it's cut and shaped into some sort of sh- shape. I don't know what is it. Explain it. Like a V shape or something. Yeah, kind of it's... V. It's it's yeah. It's it's a fucking haircut. And my question is though, Daniel, with with such a, a, a thing as they ask later on, spoilers to the dude like you must join us. Do you have to have the haircut? Because if you have the haircut, I don't want to join. I don't know. I don't know about the haircut. I think it comes from their heritage, which we'll get to in a minute. I'd have to have a wig though. I couldn't make my hair do that. Well, they meet Atmir, and as I've said, he, he sort of introduces himself. But before he manages to really speak to them, we realise he's got some people with him. How did none of them die after being in the water for so long? I don't know. The octopus was too quick. It's very weird. It's almost like this is, again, Doug McClure on an acid flashback on a boat out in the ocean. Could be. And this, I think this is all Doug he's McClure got, fucked up on a boat. He's gone down in the diving bell and he's got the bends. Would it be a really cool up. movie if you had like a, a washed up actor and this you watch the whole movie this thing that you come to and it's just at the end it's him just washed up? Oh, that'd be quite a sad ending actually. It would be. Yeah, and he's actually has to commit suicide. It's just Tom Hanks boat. washed up on a beach. Uh, so um, this Atomir guy, he's got these underwater ninja knights. That's the only way I can describe them. They're like ninja knights yeah. that travel underwater, and they've got spears. And they're like, okay, what the fuck is going on here? Well, before before very quickly, I do like the dynamic of we've got this other subplot going on where the, the, the guys have seen the uh, the captain and the Doug McClure and the Professor's son swimming over to them. They're like, we've got to keep quiet. They might not know that we what we did. So let's just pretend they're like, hi, oh, good to see you. So there's a double cross happening all it's, the way through so this. There's a subplot going on in the background, which is a nice uh, thing, actually. It's good writing, it's, actually. And it is revealed, actually, while this is all happening, back up on the boat, the Professor, who's sort of not very well, he's dying, reveals to the boy that the, the statue is actually a sign of the lost city of Atlantis. It's a, a sign from the warlords of Atlantis, and that's why the octopus attacked them, because it's it was like the guard for the city of Atlantis, this octopus. Um, and it's like a beacon, this thing that they've got on their ship. So we find that out as well. Um, yeah. Now, so, yes, back... so we've got these guards that come out of the water with their big silver head. Ninja knights. Really weird guys with like these mesh vests. They look great. They do look, look... It is a really <laughs> interesting look. One disappointing thing is you never get to see what they look like under them. Because I should imagine they might like be fish men or something. No, I like that you don't. Yeah, because you got these kind of like uh, big sort of uh, helmets. They're kind of like real elongated, kind of alien type uh, head sort of shell yeah. shape. I want to know what they look like. There's like this face underneath them, you can see it slightly, and I like that actually. You could even just make a horror movie with just one of these creatures, man. It's cool. It's like what the fuck is under there? Yeah. And that um, could be a movie where you don't need an explanation. Do you know what I mean? It's just an alien. It's going around killing people. So Charlie realises where they are. He realises they are indeed in Atlantis. They're not, they're not phased by this. They're not, yeah, of course we are. No, they're not phased. And Atmir just, just explains to them that, that there's seven cities of Atlantis. And he sort of talks about, you know, how they, they keep cr- crumbling and this there's is, war, this wars is and Troy battles. the third city. Yep. And Doug is very unhappy about this situation. Very unhappy. I've written here, a giant monster pops out, it, does nothing, it is, and it, goes away. It, yeah, it does. But it's a good-looking monster, which makes some really some really good uh, sound design for these creatures. It is. Um, but I, I didn't know what the point of it was. It was just like they realised they had an amazing effect, 
and some good sound design. And they were like, let's just put it in this film somewhere. And then just pop it back down. And that's it. It does come up again later. It though. does try. It, it, it was a precursor for later on's attack. So Atmir hints that they are, they are from somewhere else. It's a really good looking creature too. Atmir says we are from somewhere else, not of this world. Yes, they talk about evolution and stuff. It doesn't make any sense. Is is he? No, the evolution didn't start here. Well, no, I thought he was going to then go. Evolution finishes here, or something. I, I, or something. I don't know. Um. Well, they get to the third city, and everybody there seems to be preparing for some kind of battle. There's, there's or war. loads of busy people. There's market people around here. There's people with sharpened swords, and there's cannons, cannons being set up, and all these yeah. sort of things. Stakes being made. And this is where Doug spots Delphine. This is where Doug can't help but get but get a boner. He says, maybe we should look around and explore. And then he looks over and he sees her and he says, I think it would be a good idea if I explored. He does indeed. And he sees her and she's very striking. Uh, so he goes over and he helps her with her bucket. Of course is, what, is what my notes say. Uh, but this angers the Guardians... He, he goes over and says, hey, can I help you with your bucket? I'll carry it. And she's like, no, you must not. And it, I guess it, there it's a case of if he does that, that's really bad. The woman must have to do it herself. I don't know if it's an old school sexist type Well, way we find out what. they're all slaves, don't we, later? That's um, it, yeah. I don't think they're supposed to be so helped. But Two guards came over and he says, hey, fuck that shit. And he throws the bucket on them and he starts a little fisty cuffs with them. Yeah, he loves a good scrap, old Doug McClure. Throws a few punches, but the other slaves... The Professor's son joins in with 50, 50 cuffs, too. Oh, yeah. He rolls up his sleeves. He says, Bally, Bally Jove, I will knock you right square on the nose. And uh, they they get stuck in, and the other slaves, that they look around them, and the other slaves, they all seem to be from, you know, Earth, as in above the sea. So it looks like nobody there is actually like Atmir and these other guys. Mm which we learn more about in a moment. Now, Doug, McClure, and Charlie, they get taken to jail, um, or or the equivalent of jail, to have some procedure done to them, which we'll find out in a minute, means they're going to have gills put in them. It's well HP Lovecraft, this is. I can't know. I don't want little slits behind my ears. Do you? No. Jesus Christ. So Charlie's taken away separately from Doug, so they're separated. Yeah, Professor Sun, yeah, yeah. He he goes off to go go, go meet some lady who seems to be like some big bad boss. Type. Oh, she is all over him, Charlie, because she considers his mind to be one of the most uh, intelligent minds in the universe. So basically, they, they go start to groom him. Yeah. Just like Prince Andrew. Sorry, that's a bit too... <laughs> Oh, uh, Prince Andrew. Oh, dear. So, yes, uh, she says to him, you are an alpha superior. Your brain is alpha superior. And he's like, <laughs> well, thank you very much. He's already getting a little science, science boner over this. Yeah, he's definitely got a, a, a husband bulge. And my next note says, he's taken to a sexy city. And uh, seems... Oh, there, it's the spa time. It's just full of men and women bathing they're all very sexy. Yeah. They're having a great time. And he seems a bit sort of like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> Flustered. He'd yeah. be in the carry movies. This would be Charles Haltry going, air I say, <laughs> at this point. Uh, now, Delphine brings Doug some food and the rest of the guys some food. And she says, she goes back to Charlie. She says, look. Might as well tell you now. You're a very clever man. We're actually all from Mars. Wow. I never. I honestly never saw that coming on. I don't remember that from having watched this as a kid, if I did see it as a kid, that they were all Martians. But just before this, he's been shown, Professor Sun's just been shown uh, the people levitating. That's right. And she's like, well, it's easy to do once you uh, you're, unlock. You'll be able to do this, no worries. Like, once I you see... unlock certain parts of your mind, you'll be fine. You can never take with us. We we only know a little. We only use a little small part of our mind. Imagine if we could do all this shit. If we could, if we could use the rest of our mind. We mind, could communicate to this film, with our minds. I'd be floating and having major orgies. Um, 
How's the orgies come into it? Well, they just had a big orgy in their hot tubs, don't they? They're all sort of I thought... in the sexy city. Okay. I thought you were just talking about you, if you could do anything with your mind. I was just thinking, why, why an orgy? <laughs> so straight away, young, young me because I can tap into that brain, part of my brain very easy, is loving this. Because I love the hit, the story of Atlantis. Always loved that. I love the whole life on Mars kind of thing. And this has tied the two together really nicely in that the people of Mars fled Mars in, on a comet and set up an underwater city, took humans captive as slaves, gave some of them gills, bred with them, and have been just living in this lost underwater city, waiting for the next thing, the next bit of their plan, which I think is amazing. Mm. But then, but then, but then, Gav, what makes me even more excited is the next scene when in the dungeon, Doug McClaw says, oh, hey, who are you? And he's like, I'm, a, I'm captain. This is my crew. We're from a boat called the Mary Celeste. My jaw just hit the floor at this point. As we all know, the Mary Celeste was uh, a ship that was found with food and drink still on the table. But none of the crew, single member of the crew, were on this ship when it was discovered. It's a ghost ship. It's a true story. Mm. Well, now we know where they were. That's cool. They've been taking that. And they've all got gills as well. Yeah, they, they, can't, they can't really leave, though, can they? No, cannot get, leave. Because of these implant type things. And Charlie's told about the gill operation at this point. Um, and they promise him great power, you know, and, and riches and orgies and floating and all this kind of stuff. You do cut to two new creatures approaching the city's walls and they sound like cats. Well, a bell rings, doesn't it? A giant bell starts ringing and everyone runs. Oh, the cat creatures are coming. Everybody run and get ready. So this is obviously what they're all preparing for. Swords, cannons. Yeah. It's because they have to defend their city occasionally from these giant meow creatures. It's sort of... so funny. But um, I kind of like these little creatures. They just slowly plod along. They're kind of like rock creatures. They look like they're made out of rock, like rock transformers or something. They are, you know, the, there was the meteorite, the, what they called, uh, Rock Lords. That was what they looked like, the Rock Lords, which was a spin-off of the Transformers. Yeah. No, a spin-off of the GoBots. Sorry to all my GoBot fans out there. i sure Transformers had some rock dinosaurs. Uh, no, that was the GoBots. Oh, OK. Uh, they had the, the Rock Lords was they a spin-off. I didn't have them. I'd passed that in my toyness. He-Man he also had two guys that transformed into rocks as well. OK. Rock on and Stone Dar were two of the Rock comet on. warriors. Yeah, that was his name, Rock on and Stone Dar. The two guys, they were comet warriors. I'd be rock hard. Oh my god, you'd be stoned, is what you'd be. I'd, I'd be rock hard, and you'd be stoned. <laughs> Sounds like a terrible detective program. <laughs> rock on, rock. stoned. Jesus, nothing, no work gets done. One of them's always horny, and the other one's half asleep. <laughs> nothing gets done. <laughs> It's going to be a crossover with Columbo. Okay, so they fire their oh, cannons. Columbo's with us, hanging out. They fire these cannons at these creatures. They throw rocks. They fight them. Some people get eaten. Is he looking at me? No, I think he's looking at you. Oh, Peter that, gla that glass eye of his. <laughs> now, luckily, while they fight this giant dinosaur grot creatures, one of them accidentally breaks through the wall of the dungeon that Doug McClaw and his gang are in. It looks like it's going for it, like it knows there's people in there with its X-ray vision. Oh, dude, there's people in there. I'm going through this bit of the wall. Uh, luckily for them, it manages somehow to break the metal bars past them, even though they are all right. I don't know how it does that. And they manage to escape through the bars. Yeah, they all escape. It's good for them. So this is literally this giant siege from these creatures is happening and people are escaping, Doug and his guys. And when that happens, we cut back to Charlie and the Martians. Th those dinosaurs, when they uh, all creatures, when they were going up the walls, it's very reminiscent of like old uh, Godzilla films. Yeah. Re like, it's really that, looked like it. If Godzilla sounded like a cat. The same sort of era, to be honest with you. So I guess it's the same amount of technology. So Charlie, meanwhile, has been seduced by the Martians. They're saying to him... You could be one of us, Charlie. You could join us. Look, let's put this crystal helmet on you. This crystal helmet will show you all the knowledge and the power in the universe. You'll be able to see 
the whole of the universe in the future, but also the whole of the universe in the past at the same time. This is this is where we are. Oh, this is reckon where we are. We're just playing a little simulation at the moment using fucking seven percent of our ten percent of our Fuck mind or up. whatever. He's going off on one. Here we go. Come on. That's it. I reckon that's it. Well, so you reckon with this crystal helmet, that's a real thing. We'll be able to see everything in front and everything behind all at the same time. It'd be good if we could tap into the resources of 100% of our minds. What would you rather see, the future or the past? Like, if you could see any point in the past... The past? What's the point of the past? <laughs> What's... Oh, grey. Yeah, but you could see any point. You oh, could just, like... Is... You could watch Einstein having a wank. You could watch cowboys fighting. You could watch dinosaurs. You could watch the Big Bang. You could watch, You could answer all the mysteries of it's the universe for us. Also useless because it's already happened. Yeah, but it, we want to know why the Big Bang happened. The future we wanna... is a lot better because the, the <laughs> trouble. But but the trouble is though the problem is the future is useless as well because everything that you do. Oh, it'd be so. I'd be so. Fr- you know, I've got a very like oh get frustrated easily whatever, no, you, whatever you do is going to apply into the future it's going to change it so if you see oh in the year fucking 28 41 okay the, mark that the, down the, guys in your calorie the, your calories <laughs> your calendar. You, you, the planet's going to d- explode right yeah and you go well how can we change that oh if this has been done it can change it okay cool I'll change that now then the planet's going to die but explode again at another date. So you go, oh, what happened then, then? And then they're going to say, well, this is what happened. So how can I change that? We'll do that. Okay, I've done that. So then like it's going to go, oh, but now it's going to explode again. So I can't keep doing this. So this is like Aston Kutcher in the Butterfly Effect, where he keeps changing things and it gets he, worse so, and worse. So the future's fucking useless too. Basically, bollocks to all of it, just staying in the normal present time. There you go, guys. I never thought a Doug McClure film would inspire a conversation about where we're at, whether it's best to be living in the present, the future, or the past. But it did. Totally forgot we even... Yes, get back to the film. Okay, so he sees forward and backwards in time at the same time. Doug and the crew come across him, and they find him. They break the helmet, and he won't leave, so they knock him out. Knock him out. Doug, I, lo- I love the kind of man. Doug runs in, gets a helmet, just throws it to the ground. The guy's like, "What are you doing?" Like, the, obviously, this is like he's gonna tap into. Well, for him, Professor, it's like great. I could tap into all of my mind and get like learn all this shit. Now, there's always videos whenever they what, they do this stuff, this mind stuff. It's always videos of Hitler. Why is Hitler always in there? It's like they're yeah, the history. Have, yeah. They just show Hitler all the time. Like, clock, uh, clockwork Orange. Twenty eight days later. It's always Hitler. Yeah. Um. I suppose he's the most evil man that's ever lived, really, isn't he? No, I love the fact that the professor gets off and they say, Professor, tell them what you, you're you with one of us. And the professor goes, I am one. Doug's punches him, knocks him out, puts him on his shoulder, and goes, come on, we're excited, prof, we're going to go, or whatever he says. Just knock, knocks him clean out. I, I did like that, though. And they run off with him. And the Martians, they say, we love his brain. Get him back. He's got a fantastic brain. He's one in a million brain. It's their bra- his brain that they're after, isn't it? Yeah, so they want to get him back. So they, well, they wanted. If some I can't. I couldn't understand exactly what was going on here. They want to use him to help them start again, or something. Yeah, yeah because the cities keep just falling apart. So they want to. Like they, they, if they give him the gills and he can't they, leave, then he, they'll have this incredible brain. It's so Dagon, isn't it? It's good. I love it. Yeah. So Doug uses. The, um, the attack of these rock dinosaurs to cover their escape. It's very clever. Yeah, because uh, they're still fighting these do- these do- rock dinosaurs, which uh, one earlier on, one of them did actually eat a, eat a human. Yeah. Just picked I mean, them up and ate, ate him. They're not fucking around, these rock dinosaurs. They're, they're eating motherfuckers. They eat motherfuckers. And they... Uh, the, so they use that, this, and they escape. Um, and this is where... Hmm. We get flying piranha fish. I wish I was on crew throwing fish at them. Someone is off camera. Me and you could be fish tossers. <laughs> There's your punk band's name. No, that, that, that's the album of Wardors. What lots of Atlantis fish tossers? 
Atlantis. Have you heard the new album by Warlords of Atlantis? Oh, what, Fish Tossers? Oh, <laughs> so good. I, so but good. I reckon you and I could be Fish Tossers because we'd be like, fuck it, I'm going to get Doug in the face. I'm, I'm going to get a bucket I'm of fish. toss my fish into Doug's face. And I'm just throwing them off camera at all the crew. Just throwing them. Fucking hilarious, isn't it? Flying fish attack. So they get. They're like flying fish. piranha, aren't they? Like piranha two. Flying piranha. Yeah, terror in the one. sky, or whatever it's called. I've got it on VHS. Sweet. It's literally piranha on uh, fishing lines. It's James Cameron's first film. It's mad. Isn't That's it? the weirdest thing about it. <laughs> the guy that made Terminator Two: Judgment Day. It's just about come out of uh, uh, that those, those blue those blue people. Uh, Avatar Two, one. Three, Four, and Five. He's, he's got coming out over the next couple of years. Why? <sighs> Why yeah, exactly. Why I, do we need four sequels to I, Avatar, James? I picked up Terminator 2 on Blu-ray the other day because I was like, I fucking want to watch Terminator 2 again. I haven't My, seen it for years. I, was, I said to Elijah, like, I know, you, you know, I know you're eight and it's a 15, but I think you need to watch Terminator. And I was like, I've always said to him, like, I can't wait, though, dude, because uh, I won't see him for like a week. I said, I can't wait, dude, I'm going to probably have to just watch it. So, yeah. I think Terminator 2 might be one of the best action films of all time. I haven't seen it for years and I was like, I really want to watch that, so I'm going to do that tomorrow night, I think. It's it's incredible, mm. but but there we go. So where were we? Uh, oh yeah, so flying fish. So they make it out. They get to the diving bell, but Atmir is waiting for them. So he's like the king of Atlantis, and he starts firing at them, and he says, "You cannot escape from the world of Atlantis. There is no escaping the warlords of Atlantis, Doug McClaw." So they they try. They leave. They have to leave Delphine. Doug's gutted because Doug wants to bring Delphine back with him because she's a pretty little fish lady um, with her gills. And that probably means, Gav, with those gills, means she can hold her breath for quite a long time, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. That, that's where Doug McClure is interested, I think. Um, but yeah, so they, they have to leave Delphine. He wants to get sucked off by a fish woman. That's <laughs> what you're saying. Thanks for making that nice and clear. I yeah. guess the fish's mouth, I suppose. Ugh, this has gone dark. Yeah, it's gone dark. Sorry about that. Anyway, the crew all jump in, and they all manage to fit in the diving bell. They fight one of the guardians. One of the guardian ninja knights comes up in the diving bell, and they fight him. And they manage to... And again, I don't know how they do this. It's like they, really really hectic here, isn't it? All the fucking water and stuff, and the, well, the let's rapids break it down. and the mountains and the, the got, cliffs uh, and the rocks. They've got an attack of two giant fi- rock dinosaurs. People, shoot, People escaping. Shooting them. Yeah. Flying fish. Ninja knights. There's a lot of things going on. But they escape and they pilot the diving bell into a whirlpool. This should have been a canon film. Should have been. Oh, it would have been crazy if it had been. Chuck Norris would ninjas. have been. Ninjas. Nin- Atlantis ninjas, it would have been called. Yeah. Ninjas of Atlantis. Ninjas Make of Atlantis. It. Warlord um, ninjas. Ninja, so, Ninja Warlord. So they pilot the diving bell into a whirlpool, and it spins out of control, and it starts to go back up, and they see the ship. And we're all thinking, as an audience, Doug, because Doug's going, thank God, there's the ship. Everyone's going to be so happy to see us. And the crew is in the diving bell and with them. And like, they let the crew go first. And they get, and I'm like, oh no! It's like they got to get their comeuppance at some point. Because we, as an audience, know that this crew who've helped Doug McClure escape, yeah, actually did a mutiny earlier in this film. So we know that they're not. They're probably going to stab them in the back. Yeah. So they get there and they swim onto the ship. Like you said, they uh, the crew got on first, and the young ship hand, he starts shooting at the uh, the mutineers. And Doug McClaw's like, whoa, whoa, I'm Doug McClaw. What's, what's happened? Yeah, and the little kid's like, yeah, those dudes shot the captain. And they're like, no, 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 he's, he's joking. He's joking. He doesn't There's know what no to talk way about. No, he's they're been like, they dehydrated. Cut the, they cut the fucking line for your uh, observation submarine and they let you fucking drop to the surface. And it starts clicking with Doug. He's but he fucks up. He's got the upper hand and it all just totally fucks up, doesn't it? Yeah, but how? How does it fuck up? It's, I don't know, how does it have fuck up? It's just ridiculous. Well, the mutiny starts again, but luckily in the middle of this 
Yeah, the, the gun gets flipped somehow. The baddies get it, and then all of a sudden they say, "Right, no," because the captain get, takes it, and the captain's done a little ruse because they were going to try and knock out the captain earlier. But the captain's actually as bad as those guys. Yep. He wants the gold, so he says, "You two get over here now," because the other one of the three sailors, the small guy, he a small fella, he was killed by a monster who ate him. So it is now the captain and two sailors, two bad sailors. Well, luckily, Gav. They've still got that piece of... Uh, Michael Myers octopus head. Uh, yeah, they've still got the Atlantis uh, statue on on board. And that, of course, attracts Michael Myers the octopus. Yeah. And he attacks once again. Slowly comes up the wall and just slowly goes towards... Me. All more a bit like... Uh, is it in Zombie Flesh Eaters? Um... That's, um, isn't that where it, it, the zombies slowly going up, coming out of the water? No, Land of the Dead probably does it as well, actually. Yeah, it's, it's maybe one or two. Um, but it's got that thing that Octopus has this kind of slow, like, almost like a horror c- character. Like Apocalypse Now. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, it wants to steal the statue back, which it does. It grabs the statue and it starts wrecking the ship, this octopus. Um, Doug, while that's happening, it's, again, it's hectic because Doug starts fighting the baddies, the guys that have done the mutiny. Uh, the ship starts sinking. Um, the goodies... The octopus just starts bashing the ship up with the fucking statue. Yeah, it's like, fuck you guys, you human <laughs> bastards. Yeah. But Doug and the goodies all get into a lifeboat. Doug and the goodies. Doug and the goodies. They get in a lifeboat and the octopus leaves them alone and it sinks the ship... And then it slowly sinks down into the depths, back to Atlantis. Yeah. And uh, they all all try and fit in the lifeboat. And that's a very abrupt ending to Warlords of Atlantis. Yes. And They're just it. all in the lifeboat. We don't we don't know. I mean, this what they could have done here, Gav, is that's they could have made they could have made this one first, and then the guys in the lifeboat then end up at the beginning of the movie we covered before this. That would have been cool. And then they end up... It's like just when you think they've come out of fucking gonna, Atlantis and it's all okay, they end up going to the land before time. I think... That, time I think, forgot. I think the start of it is going to be them having a nervous breakdown, though. I think they could be slightly exhausted. They fought rock dinosaurs, Atlanteans... Then it'd be like, great, now there's dinosaurs. Now they know there's real aliens. Maybe that's kids. why they're not phased, because that is actually what's happening. Well, it'd be like, oh, look, there's a dinosaur. I'm, so, I'm too tired you know what, guys? to care. I don't care because I saw some Martians yesterday that are actually Atlantis. I'm, I'm, I'm just too tired to care. And, you know, and I've lost my pencil. So. Do you recommend this to the average viewer? I do. I really do. I, I actually prefer the first movie, though. I like the creatures in this one. I prefer the first one, too. I actually found this one a little bit harder to watch towards the end. I found it slowed down quite a lot. Um, and I enjoyed the first half again, like I did the I, other one. I don't know why. What I liked about this one the most, so my favourite things were that the Martians, the Adla- the people from Atlantis are actually from Mars originally, and I love all that ancient Martian, te- you know, technology pyramids on Mars and all that shit. So all of that really appeals to me. Um, but you're right, there was... It felt like it didn't really go anywhere once once we got to Atlantis. It, 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 well, there's no more surprises. It, it was just it, a giant attack by dinosaurs. I think it, dropping all of it in too quickly was, was probably something we shouldn't have done. Like the fact that it's just, oh, it's dinosaurs, I'm not surprised by it. We were just jumped into this dinosaur world. And it's okay keeping it with the fantasy element of it, I guess. But, yeah, it does. It just once you've seen it all open up all of the pages, you're kind of going, like, well, it doesn't go anywhere else. The best thing about it for me is the writing. It tricks you as an audience member into forgetting that the guys did the mutiny. I didn't because I was like, I hope they get still. Oh, well, that's I cool. They I... better get their comeuppance. But but do you know what I mean? Like you kind of do at times. You forget, and then at the right point, you suddenly remember. Oh shit! Doug can't trust these guys, but he doesn't know that. Yeah. And then so just when it kind of all of the crazy monster battleships finished mm. we end back up on the boat with just a straight up you know mutiny and then a giant octopus interrupts and yeah. boom so wow that what a ride that was it was good 
Really good. Um, uh, but like I said, it did slow down a bit for me. I prefer the other one. Um, but yeah, it was all right. I, I, the creatures were very good. The sound design was really interesting. Uh, not, not really into the cat meowing. Uh, um, but yeah. It's just a bit. Uh, but um, yeah, anyway, yeah, cool. Yeah. That noise, it wasn't like it wasn't a meow. It's more like a. It, it was more of a. It's, it's more of like a tom, um, a tom cat. But, but that noise is used so much. It's used in loads of cartoons. Type thing. It's great. Um, uh, yeah, so that's that's another Patreon episode done. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, thank you, RJ. If for you in. want to join in like this and get your name on the ro- roster, the uh, the list on rotation, um, and have your picks come up and choose some movies for us to review. You can, by joining you the Patreon. Yes, indeed. And uh, we have our next Patreon lined up, but I won't say anything yet about that. Um, but, yeah, I've I've enjoyed this. This has been fun. This has been just as fun as, as Matthew's picks. You know, I never, ever would have thought we'd do two Doug McClaw uh, movies. You know, a guy, guy's accidentally coming across dinosaurs and casually just, oh... <laughs> Really, Dinosaur. really casually. Brilliant. So, love That's that. Good. Yeah. Um, well, let, interesting. Let's get out yeah. of here and uh, come back and close up the show. I think. I'm very, very quickly just before on the last bit of these films, Sarah said to me, she went, "Oh, it'd be interesting. It'd be the first time I've listened to this and I've not watched a movie." She normally watches the films before. I don't know if anyone else does who listens. Um, she watches the films before we're going to talk about them. So then she just. Do you know what I mean? Listen to uh, the yeah. same as we have. Uh, but she said, be so I think it's going to be quite the same with a lot of people who probably have not had a chance to find or see these films. So um, I hope we uh, went through them well enough the majority, to tell the stories the ma- of them. I think the majority of people would have, similarly to us, seen these in their very young days uh, and not watched them for years. 50 50, I don't think there's going to be many. I think some people, yes, of our age, but any younger than I don't think so. Well, the main thing is, RJ, I hope we've done this justice. Yeah. We really enjoyed it. Thank you ever so much. So, yes. We'll come back in a minute, guys, and we'll close up the show. Let's do it. See you in a bit. Back again for the outro. Back again for the last time. 125. I know. 125 yeah. episodes with a couple of bonus ones. We've done, done quite a few shows over the years, haven't we? Yeah. Crazy. We'll be coming up to, um, I think, nine nine years of podcasting this Christmas. Is that right? Uh, yes, it, uh, yes, it is nine years. Fuck it out. That's it's a bit weird, isn't it? Imagine when we've been cod- podcasting for ten years. I'd rather be cod pasting. Cod pasting. Cod pasting. <laughs> well, a, lot, was... a lot of fish tossing going on here. <laughs> that was episode 125. That was our patron pick for RJ McCready and. It was a blast, but... from Definitely from the past. A blast from the past. What is coming up next, Gab? Do you want to know what's coming up next? I'd love to know. Okay, so our schedules have been thrown off a little bit because of COVID and trying to find Doug McClaw films on DVD. And we do have, obviously, certain uh, seasonal and episodic things which happen at months Indeed. which we have to throw in at around the right time. Indeed. So we've had to um, speed up our Halloween episode. So... Our next episode we're going to do before Halloween is still going to be our Nicolas Cage special looking at Mandy and Colour Out of Space. I was going to say Colour Me Bad then, but that would it's not Colour Me Bad. Just going to review the, the band. Yeah. Sex, I want to sex you up. With Nicolas Cage playing each character in the band. Just weird. Um, but yeah, that's episode 126, Nicholas Cage special, Mandy, Colour Out of Space, HP Lovecraft, Nicholas Cage, crazy shit. Woo. And then episode 127, because of our scheduling, now will be our Halloween special. And we, we've done a couple of these now, so in keeping with a little series we're doing, we're going to be looking at the next episodes in the franchise of the Nightmare on Elm Street and Halloween. Meaning, we'll be doing a Nightmare on Elm Street 3, The Dream Warriors. Yes. And <clears throat> Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. You know, interesting movies. I'm not a massive fan of the Nightmare on Elm Street films, but I do know Part 3 is one which is beloved by the fans. And we had a blast with Part 2, don't forget. I'm a fan of part two, and it's the only movie of the nightmares I like. 
it's really good but three is fun the effects are crazy and brilliant yeah i'm totally interested in watching all the nightmare on elm street films again actually uh, as a reviewer and just coming to watch them yeah in that sense i think i'm quite interested especially when they start going when freddy started going a bit cheesy and a bit shit i'll be interested just to watch them for the podcast but I'm really interested in talking to you about Season of the Witch and the craziness behind that and Tom Atkins. Oof. It's weird because a couple, well, a few years ago now, I watched Season of the Witch again. I'd watched it many, many times as a massive avid fan. Watched it and uh, and just went, I don't know, actually. So I oh. might have, I, yeah, I know, I might have changed a bit. I don't know, so... Um, it's a must watch for me every October yeah, it is a really good film but I think I don't know I think maybe I've d- outdone the fun of it for me you've watched it too many times I think I've let the videotape be watched too many times and the tracking lines are so bad I can't get them out well that's the next two episodes we aren't decided on the, the one after that guys just because of scheduling um, and all that kind of stuff so we're only going to reveal those two episodes coming up but uh, yeah if you like Nicolas Cage and if you like Halloween and Freddy and Michael, that's what's coming up over the next two episodes. Michael's not in it. Michael's not in it. You said He's Halloween, not... Freddy and Michael. Michael Myers is not in Halloween 3. He's on the TV at one point. <laughs> it's a bit loose. All right. So that was that. That was 125. Enjoyed that? Did you enjoy that? I did enjoy that. Listeners, did you enjoy that? Yes, yes, Captain Dan. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Um, anything you want to uh, talk about as we wrap up? No, I hope everyone's safe in the world and everyone's all good and happy and all that stuff. Um, no, no, not really. Um, it's funny, as, when we don't record, things happen in my life. I'm going to tell Dan about that. I'm going to tell listeners about that time the kids were just annoying, my, annoying me so much. <laughs> and have these things that pop up. I'm going to tell that on the show and then I forget. No. Yeah, nothing interesting's happened other than the fact that in the same week we got a new prime minister and a new king. Mm. Um, mm. Other than that, but yeah, all right. Well, let's do the admin and then we can say our goodbyes to everybody. Um, so, as always, podcast on Haunted Hill is a proud member of Legion Podcast Network. Go to the legionpodcast.com website to find out more about us and all the other websites in the uh, network. It's awesome. We're proud. We're happy. Uh, the other shows are just as good as ours, if you like ours. If you don't like ours, the other shows are just as good as ours. <laughs> yeah, don't like I don't know ours. what that says about them. Yeah. Um, but also, if you go on Facebook, just go to Legion Podcasts. Um, and you'll find out more and more there. Everyone's chatting on that page. It's awesome. Same with us. We've got the podcast on Haunted Hill page on Facebook. That's where we're most active. You can chat to me and Gav on there. You can private message us. You can post up what you're watching. You can post up your 31, what you're watching every day. Oh, everybody, October. join in on 31 and 31. Yeah, just, just give it a go. It's just for a laugh. It's going to be exciting. It's always very, it's, very busy. Exciting. Again, no rules. You can do one every day if you if you're real hardcore, um, or you can do multiples a day or at different points. You know. Yeah, it's going to be interesting for me because last year I was able to get through about sixty films. I was surprised, the, but obviously the, the yeah the because the kids were, were so small. I was able to do it, but this year, because they're so active... Yeah, you, that's what I said. I was just like, you know, I think you're going <laughs> to... Going forward, you have struggling, but then you'll put it back again. But for me, not a problem at all. And I can watch them with my kids. Indeed. You can also also email us if you go... Uh, if you just Our email address is the podcast on Haunted Hill at outlook.com. Um, so that's another way you can contact us and where you can listen to us is wherever the hell you listen to us right now but if you don't know where that might be then it's Spotify, YouTube, Podknife, Apple, Podcast Addict um, Podbean and many many other places wherever you get podcasts you can generally find us um, the podcast on Haunted Hill we're the only podcast on Haunted Hill there is another podcast I'll mention briefly called The Homos on Haunted Hill uh, which is, I believe, a couple of gay guys reviewing horror movies. It's a similar uh, name podcast, but we're the podcast, they're the homos. And that's them. their name of them. I'm not being derogatory when I say that. 
But go check those guys out. I've never actually listened to the show. I don't know what it's like. Um, just thought I'd mention that because it always comes up if you Google it. Uh, and also, we're on Twitter, at Haunted Podcast. We're on Instagram, the podcast on Haunted Hill Insta. We've talked about Deadbolt Films. We're very excited that Shadow of Death is looking like it's going to get distributed on DVD, baby. Unless you've jinxed it. Unless I've jinxed it. And if I have, then I do apologise to the film gods. Uh, but that is deadboltfilms.com as our website, where you can find out about all of our shorts, all of our longs, <laughs> Justin Long, all of our dick mass, and comics, and other podcasts. Talking of which, Gab, you do another podcast. Uh, the, the High Strangers podcast with my dearest Sarah, uh, and we look at spooky dooky things. Uh, we are delayed for an episode because of COVID. Um, uh, Lots of serial killers on that one as well. Yeah, we just did BTK, um, which is quite an interesting character. Very, very scary. He's Nightmare Fuel. He's, he's, he's basically the boogeyman. He's Michael Myers in your wardrobe, waiting for you. Uh, uh, to be asleep then go and take a knife to your throat sort of thing nice very, very, very scary you know uh, yeah uh, we do that and it's a, it's a fun a fun podcast to do episode 50 is coming up soon and we're going out to the woods to wander around where the woods have had sightings of Bigfoot fucking or oh, something no not Bigfoot werewolf uh, UFOs and all sorts and we could actually go out to the woods film a little video and then do the podcast in the car for episode 50 coming up soon so this might be the last time I ever speak to you yeah, it's supposed to be some spooky dooky woods, so we're going to go up there um, and we're going to wait till it gets dark and go out with torches into the woods and film it. So, deadbotfilms.com and deadbotfilms.com. And that would on be YouTube. on YouTube when we do that video. In about, in about a month's time or so, you probably should be able to see that video. So, jump on YouTube and type in Deadbot Films to find out that. Uh, Deadbot Films is on Instagram, just as Deadbot Films. Subscribe. And we're on Twitter at Deadbot Films. Yes. Um, very briefly, I you also do, do a podcast. I do indeed. I do another podcast with our Jamie McCready, our patron, our king patron for the day, and that is called "Blame It on the Aliens," where we look at various urban legends, myths, stories, and ultimately debate whether or not it is aliens or whether it is something else. We've covered the uh, Bermuda Triangle. We've covered the. Uh, a, a very specific event that happened in Zimbabwe where a spaceship landed in a school playground and for our next episode we're covering uh, a giant that apparently the US Marines fought in the Afghanistan desert uh, it came out of a cave it was about 8 foot tall it had uh, I think orange skin and a spear and they shot and killed it and took it back and then all had to sign uh, forms so they could never disclose or discuss what they'd seen so did it happen or did it not is it aliens but that's blame it on the aliens easy to find us blame it on the aliens podcast nice and easy there's links everywhere um, and finally and most, most importantly in some ways patron um, if you would like to become a patron supporter we don't ever ask that you no one has to do it but if you want to and you want to support us even with a pound or a dollar a month then it is incredibly generous and helpful of you to do so and massively appreciated and massively appreciated the money goes towards uh, well firstly you'd get a free t-shirt also you get free content such as us releasing our old episodes every freaky friday uh, i've just put episode 46 or 47 up can't remember which one it was now um and we do occasionally release exclusive content um and sometimes you'll get the episodes slightly ahead of when they come out to the general public um, and it also just shows that you're supporting us and if you do it the other thing you get to do is pick two movies for us to review um, so as always thank you to our patrons and I'll name you all uh, now Gav I know you always like to say a great big heartfelt thanks as well to them absolutely uh, thank you very much um, it makes it um, great to uh, do this stuff and uh, again I quite enjoy this uh patrons pick things because it's uh, quite nice to sit down and go oh, I'm doing this for you guys um, I'm actually sitting down and reviewing it for you guys it's, it's nice to uh... it feels nice doesn't it yeah so yeah. thank you thanks very much it's nice to yeah get get, get your so, generous offers for our, our our words so thank you then to our patrons <clears throat> we'll start with RJ McCready uh, who had his picks for this episode so thank you RJ McCready Don Collier Matthew Godley Jamie Jenkins, Kevin S. Five, Sarah Kay, 
Rachel and Lex Boo for Thank being you. our Patreon supporters. Amazingly, everybody love you lots. Love you all so much. And that is us. Oh, and if you want to support Late Legion, I should probably mention Legion podcasts have their own Patreon as well. Absolutely. Gav, Gav and I both obviously support that, being members of one of the shows on the network again if you want to support that you'll get exclusive content from all of those shows as well a lot of those shows release stuff early there's even a few shows that only release content on on the legion patron so there's plenty of stuff out there guys if you can donate a pound or two dollars or whatever it is a month and that is us done and dusted that's Mm. all the admin that's all the movies that's all the world of the strange stories that's all the tangents that's all the time we've got for you this week on the podcast on Haunted Hill. That was good, didn't it? It was great. We don't do it every week, though, do we? I'm not happy if I do that every week. <laughs> It'd be hard to do every week, is what you mean. Well, we need to say good night. So do, indeed. It's a good night from Doug McClaw. Of it course. Is, it's a good night from the man with the haircut. <laughs> it's a good night from uh, my diving bell. It's a good night from the creature. Which one? I don't know. Choose. Lots of them. And it's a good night from my dinosaur sandwich. And it's a good night from me. And it's a good night from you. Not surprised and faced by this dinosaur meat I'm eating. Oh. Well, get the caveman over here to DJ for us, please. Caveman's DJ, I mean dinosaur eating. Um, it's like we're an just 80s a song, isn't it? And, Gav, uh, Gav, can you please help me with my oil refinery in the garden? It's weird. Um, uh, be safe, everybody. Lock, lock the windows, lock the doors, look under the covers, look under the bed. And remember, if you see a big cave underwater, it's probably going to take you to another planet full of dinosaurs. Be surprised. Get stuck in. <laughs> Enjoy yourself. Uh, come on, thanks very much for listening. Please come again. Uh, like, rate, subscribe, etc., etc. Tell the world! Thank you very much. Peace out. Thank you for listening to the podcast on Haunted Hill. We will be back again real soon.